If you already have children, which is the majority of people who seek out abortions, and you're worried about poverty, which is valid, and you're seeing your children not be able to eat, and you're seeing all these systemic problems, your kids are getting shot in school, these are not just fears. These are valid concerns that cause people to say, you know what, I don't want to bring a baby into this inhospitable place where I might die. And that's why I got so frustrated, and I still feel that frustration inside of me on what I'm calling the mouse wheel, because our aligning and deciding we agree when life begins will not also change my stance on what needs to happen and that abortion needs to be accessible until we can make sure those freaking women aren't dying out there. I think we have to get into that conversation about how we um, help women who are being coerced and support women who are in low-income situations or abusive relationships, giving them the help that they need, connecting them to the resources that they, that they deserve. That's all very crucial. But I do think it's essential to establish a starting point here. You don't want to define when that a child in the womb is a person, except unless they're 21 weeks old. Is that correct? So they, they don't get legal protection and a moral status until they are 21 weeks. And that sounds very arbitrary to me. It, sounds, it doesn't sound scientific. It doesn't sound fair. It doesn't sound just. And you know, my understanding of your position is you're about nuance and the gray area, but you're drawing a very black and white line in an arbitrary place and saying because of that line, a child at 19 weeks can be live dismembered in an abortion and you don't consider that violence and you don't consider that 19 week old baby even a person. And my position is saying, I don't think that's loving or just. The science is conclusive when human life begins and a unique individual human life begins at the moment of fertilization. That was Lila Rose and Brenda Davies, two advocates with very opposing views on the topic of abortion. The debate around a woman's right to choose to end a pregnancy, bodily autonomy, and babies in the womb deserving basic human rights and protection is a heated one, but so important. And what a fire conversation we just had. Brenda is a writer, podcaster, and left-leaning pro-choice Christian living in Los Angeles. Hi, beautiful people. My name is Brenda Davies. I'm the creator of God is Gray. Today we're talking about abortion, on why I am a Christian who votes pro-choice, cares as much about babies at the border as I do about babies in the womb. I believe in God and global warming. The main reason I'm pro-choice is because abortions will happen whether they're legal or not. We are going to clarify all of that, and I want you to. Read up on 1973's Roe vs. Wade. This Supreme Court decision made abortion legal until the fetus is viable. <laughs> Everyone's gonna say, God is not gray, he's black and white. And I, I, was, I was like, I'm gonna have to argue this for the rest of my life. It's like to protect yourself, not fully identifying as something that is marginalized and shamed and all of that. Exactly. We are living in the gray space. I am so sick of the cliche that pro-choice people love abortion and don't care if the numbers increase when an absolute provable fact, our party does more to prevent abortion than the pro-life party ever has. Her YouTube channel, God is Grey, has over 10 million views and her work attracts a growing audience of 250,000 people in 44 countries. Her debut novel, On Her Knees, Memoir of a Prayerful Jezebel, received rave reviews and has maintained Amazon's number one position in gender and sexuality. Brenda believes that forced birth is immoral and that abortion can be better prevented by making this nation a more hospitable place for new and existing life with left-leaning policies like gun reform, taking climate change seriously on behalf of our children, raising wages and taxing the 1% more, and solving our nation's maternal death problem. She's passionate about educating people on what she considers the dangers of purity culture and she's LGBTQ affirming. Lila, a writer, speaker, and pro-life activist, is the founder and president of Live Action, a human rights nonprofit with the largest digital footprint on the globe for the pro-life movement. This is an abortion industry dream come true. Lila Rose, the president of Live Action. Don't you feel that your positions, your extreme positions, are just forcing women toward these more dangerous options? I think that, Sally, we should dare to have a better view for America and our women by saying we shouldn't believe and have to think that women need abortion and that we have to kill our children to achieve the dreams and the careers and the families that we want. I think we can do better than that as a society. I think women deserve better.
It calls itself Planned Parenthood, and the deception begins right there. When people learn the facts of human development in the womb, when they learn the facts of the brutality of the abortion procedure, they change. What? That is sad. Yeah, I do, I do, I do change my mind. I think we should fight at the community level for programs that are positive, that help women if they're single mothers. We should improve the foster care system. We should improve the adoption system so that we can welcome children to this country instead of seeing them as a threat and killing them by the thousands each day. Live Action exists to defend the rights of the unborn and make abortion unthinkable. With over 5.6 million social media followers and 1.4 billion video views, Live Action reaches up to 100 million people per month. Lila's investigative reporting on the abortion industry has been featured in most major news outlets, including the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, CBS, and ABC Nightline. She's the author of Fighting for Life, Becoming a Force for Change in a Wounded World. She's been named among National Journal's 25 Most Influential Washington Women Under 35, and she often speaks internationally on family and cultural issues. Not many issues are more polarizing and heated than the topic of abortion. A huge problem in this world today when navigating opposing views on any topic, but especially one like this, is how often one side labels the other as having poor or even evil intentions. But the reality is that most people have pure intentions for what they think is the most kind and helpful and progressive, and in this case, what they consider more progressive towards equality of human rights. They're just thinking with a different lens. Pro-life advocates believe in the inherent value and human rights of the unborn. Pro-choice advocates believe women should have the right to choose whether to continue a pregnancy or not and that banning abortion takes away bodily autonomy. Both have pure intentions. That's one reason why conversations like this are so important, to understand why the other thinks the way that they do. The other reason conversations like this are so integral is to get to the heart of the issue. It's easy to listen to one side you gravitate towards and the lean on euphemisms that sound good, but is the side you listen to really speaking the truth? And do you really have all the facts if you aren't hearing both sides? Rather than go into this conversation determined not to change your mind, what if instead you went into the conversation determined to understand the way the other side thinks? It's likely you've already established some opinions about this topic, but how much time have you listened to the other side and the reasons they think the way that they do? If you listen with an open heart, you are much more likely to at least understand how and why the opposing view got to their viewpoint. And understanding brings people together. Understanding creates empathy and openness and more common ground than what is normally found. And with authentic curiosity, you may even learn something you hadn't considered before or even change your mind. These types of conversations are so important, yet becoming increasingly rare. I value diversity of thought, and truly, opposing views are my favorite type of conversation. I personally have an opinion about this topic, but I'm going into this discussion as the moderator. My hope is that by the end of the conversation, you can't tell which side of the issue I land on, letting you, the audience, hear two really well-spoken women on both sides of the issue speak to their heart of the pro-life versus pro-choice perspectives. I've gotten the pleasure to get to know both women personally before this conversation, and I can tell you without a doubt that both women are lovely, strong, and passionate women, and I respect and appreciate their friendships. Please be respectful in the comments. I want to do more opposing views episodes in the future, but it's going to be a lot harder to organize them and get people on board for a public discussion if the comments are riddled with nastiness. If you are tempted to become a keyboard warrior and say things like anti-abortionists are anti-women's rights and just want to control women's bodies or pro-choice is just want more babies to die, then it's clear you are misunderstanding what the majority of people on both sides of the issue are thinking. I urge you to strengthen the muscle of understanding why someone thinks the way that they do. Thank you so much to Lila and Brenda for coming on the show. It requires a lot of bravery and vulnerability to have such an honest discussion openly and publicly. I'm thankful for you both. Without further ado, my favorite episode so far, let's get into the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast, everyone, and especially welcome Brenda and Lila. Thank you so much for being here. I cannot express 
enough gratitude because I am just so looking forward to this conversation and it's so rare to be able to have conversations like this, especially publicly where other people can listen and engage and really hear each other go back and forth with like opposing views. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Me yes. too. <laughs> and for those listening and watching, we're gonna basically be doing a format where each person is gonna get to respond to each question, but I'll be directing a lot of the questions to a specific person, but they're gonna get to go back and forth and we're gonna just get started. <laughs> okay, so my first question is, in two minutes or less, explain your position and why you are pro-choice or pro-life. So Brenda, why don't you go first? Okay, I'm gonna reference something I wrote down because I think the language is important, but I am pro-reproductive rights and reproductive justice, meaning the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, equal access to safe abortion, affordable contraceptions and comprehensive sex education, the freedom from sexual violence, and as defined by Sister Song, the right to parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. So in lieu of the inhumane removal of a person's God-given autonomy. I am someone who focused on the efforts of making the US a more habitable place for all while focusing on pregnancy prevention. So I wouldn't call myself pro-choice, I would say all of that. <laughs> yes, longer drawn out. Yeah. What about you, Lila? Well, I'm 100% pro-life because I think all human life is precious and deserves protection. Whether you're an unborn child or you're an adult or you're an elder, a per, an elder, you deserve protection legally and you deserve to be embraced by society. And I also think that the bonds of love that connect us are some of the most precious things in the world. And the bond of love between a mother and her child should be protected and supported and never, never pushed towards violence, uh, especially against that unborn child. And I also believe that abortion is not the solution to any problem that a woman faces. I mean, I believe in um, a, a bodily autonomy. I think that's very important. Um, you mentioned reproductive rights, Brenda, and I, I agree. We, we have reproductive rights as human beings, but when there's a child that's already been reproduced, reproduction has already taken place. Now it's a question of human rights for that child as well as human rights for the mother. So I think we have to chase after both legally and in our society uh, the upholding of everyone's human rights and never pit a mother against her child or family members against each other, but instead acknowledge that every human being has the same human rights and those need to be protected. And the first human right is life, the right to live. Okay, I think that really is a great way to start where you show like your foundational <laughs> principles. So the next like basic question, how would you answer the question, what is abortion in one sentence? Lila, you go first. Abortion is the direct and intentional killing of an innocent child. Brenda? Abortion is a procedure that ends a pregnancy. Okay, great. So now we're going to get into some foundational questions that may take a little bit for you guys to be able to go back and forth on because it really is the foundation of why you guys believe the way that you do. So my first question to you, Brenda, is do you believe that it is always wrong to commit intentional violence on an innocent human person? This is such a loaded question, especially the way it's worded. I don't think anyone should be perpetuating any violence against anyone. And the disclaimer of innocence doesn't bear weight to me. I think everyone should be allowed to live without violence. Um, also, I mean, that question is implying that the abortion procedure is a violent act against a life, which is not necessarily something I believe. I think for me, the moral stance or the complication on when life starts is where we really get in the mud and the mire of things where like as opposed to really looking at the issues and the systemic problems that lead to an abortion. Um, so I'm getting lost on the question for a second. Yeah, so I can just repeat it again. Yeah. Do you believe, I know, it's it's worded toughly. Yeah, and like this for, is a really hard one. Yeah, because the for anyone listening or watching too, like my intention is to word questions in a way that like a pro-choice person would, would ask a pro-life person and a pro-life person would ask a pro-choice person. Mm -hmm. So that, that has been my intention. So, mm -hmm. so this one is, do you believe that it's always wrong to commit intentional violence on an innocent human person? Yeah, so <laughs> I don't know. It's a really impossible question, I think, for me to answer because I just think fundamentally it doesn't actually present 
the issue with abortion or how we're going to figure it out or how we're going to solve it. Like it's kind of where I'm getting in the mire of trying to like not get in these circular mouse wheel kind of arguments with people about when does life begin and when is it not okay to do this anymore versus really focusing on the harm that is being done systematically all throughout our society that causes a woman or a person who's pregnant to feel that this is their only choice. Okay. Could, could I follow up? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, not sure the, the, yeah. the status here. So um, thank you for sharing that. When you say that, um, I think you were saying, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Originally you said you think it is violence against innocent persons or any persons is wrong, but then you were saying you're not sure abortion is violence. Um, how do you define violence? Well, it's the, the personhood. It, it's like such a complicated mm. question because there's so many words that you could pull out of there and realize how complicated each one is because a personhood for me begins at viability. That's my personal belief. And some pro um, reproductive right people wouldn't necessarily agree with me on that. They, so, mm, no, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. So just to understand, so you're saying you can't commit violence against a child in the womb before 20 weeks because you don't consider them a person. So in the case of you know, a, a, an abusive boyfriend or husband who tries to force a miscarriage for a woman who's pregnant in the first trimester, you wouldn't consider that an act of violence against her first trimester baby because it's not a person yet. I mean, yeah, I would. I think what people really don't understand is that I'm sitting at this table because abortion is something that I find very tragic and it's something that I want more than anything else to help be preventable in the society. I think from top to bottom, the whole situation can cause a lot of pain and does cause a lot of pain. And I do think that it is a moral conundrum all of these these questions however i believe what i do and i champion the right to a person's bodily autonomy and their right to choose an abortion because i look at a society mm -hmm. and a place and a system and a foster care system and a prison industrial complex and poverty that makes this world less habitable for those people that we would want to that you would want to see like end up in society. I'm like tripping over words because the personhood, yeah, makes it complicated. But this is gonna be my hardest question yeah. because the definitions are just really convoluted. And to me, no matter how I answer this question, it doesn't really get to the root of why I'm sitting at this mm -hmm. table and what I think needs to happen mm -hmm. to prevent abortion from occurring. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more of a personal thing. And I think my personal stance on it isn't as valid as a lot of the points I'll make later mm -hmm. in the conversation. But to understand you better here, and I agree that there's a whole world of discussion around making life better for humans. And I wanna have that. I mean, that's an incredibly important discussion. How do we make society better, have healthier relationships? But we are living in a society right now where there are around 800,000 children in utero who are killed every day or year by illegal, by legal abortion, legal abortion. And so it's the leading cause of death for children. It's the leading cause of death for people in the United States. It's a leading cause of death. It beats out cancer. It beats out any other cause of death is abortion. So that's why I'm here. That's the why the leading I've, cause I've, of death for children is gun violence. I mean, that again goes into like personhood and language. Mm -hmm. are, it's the leading cause of death for so I mean, I think, abortion is just mm -hmm. abortion. To me, it's like a completely separate thing. If we're talking about the leading causes of death in society for children, it's gun up and gun mm -hmm. violence right now. So gun violence is a tremendous problem, and there's about 7,000 children, six to seven, killed every year because of guns in this country. There's 800,000 children killed every year because of abortions. So and there's 400,000 kids in foster care. So they, it all deserves our attention. But yeah. I think what you're saying is, you're saying, my understanding of what you're saying, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you don't want to define when that a child in the womb is a person, except unless they're 21 weeks old. Is that correct? So they, they don't get legal protection and a moral status until they are 21 weeks. And that sounds very arbitrary to me. It sounds, it doesn't sound scientific. It doesn't sound fair. It doesn't sound just. And, you know, my understanding of your position is you're about nuance and the gray area, but you're drawing a very black and white line in an arbitrary place and saying because of that line a child at 19 weeks can be live dismembered in an abortion and you don't consider that violence and you don't consider that 19 week old baby even a person 
And my physician is saying, I don't think that's loving or just. It's not an arbitrary number. It's the, the place of viability. And but also, why, why is viability the, the, the place? Because it's when a, uh, a baby mm -hmm. can live outside of the, the womb, the uterus, without the mother's aid. And it matters because forcing birth on people, children as young as 10 years old, a childbearing age, and perhaps also rape and incest victims, which we can get into that too, because there's even um, women who have been raped or have experienced incest that were happy to have their children. So there's like nuance in all of these, and no one wants to be used as the example of why we should be making these really hard decisions as a society. It's just, the black and white that I feel you are trying to bring me into is this personhood thing, which is it is not right based on when or how I decide when a personhood is applicable to the fetus. Whereas, I'm sorry, I keep getting lost. No, it's all good. Yeah, it's just, it's the hardest question to start I think, with. I think maybe because you care so much about these it's other just issues. That, okay, like really the way that I would frame this is by saying that this moment right here mm -hmm. to me is a waste of time. And I don't mean to say that in any degrading way to anyone sitting at this table or anyone who believes in the importance of the validity of trying to figure out when life begins or when we're honoring that. But for me, it becomes almost irrelevant because of all of the other issues that are piled on top of this, where I see so many people in the anti-abortion camp voting against it, acting against things that would make this place more viable for life. So if we talk about, OK, I believe that life begins at conception, which biblically, life begins at first breath according to like at least four Bible verses, that is something. And God also orders an abortion in the Bible. But even that, I would not want to hang my hat on the Bible to even inform this conversation because these are all like moralistic, moralistic ideas. They're not actual, actually provable. They cannot be concrete. It's a matter of your own personal morality and your opinion. So with all of that being said, if you believe that life begins at conception, then I want to see what you are doing to make sure that no one has to have an abortion that they didn't want to have because of poverty, because mm -hmm. of all these other issues that are happening. And that personal moral stance in that case is not as valid to me because it doesn't actually answer any of the questions that are going to help us decrease abortion numbers or even eradicate it, if that's mm -hmm. your dream. So I think we have to, if we can keep going, I think we have to get into that conversation about how we um, help women who are being coerced and support women who are in low-income situations or abusive relationships to make sure that they are not coerced into abortion. I think abortion and coercion go hand in hand. And a lot of the work of the pro-life movement, I'm not sure how familiar are with it, but is supporting women who are in difficult situations so that they are empowered to not turn to violence and not have to have an abortion, but choose life and protect their children provide them financial material care, you know, thousands of pregnancy resource centers providing that financial material care, um, supporting women, giving them the help that they need, connecting them to the resources that they, they deserve. That's all very crucial. But I do think it's essential to establish a starting point here because the reality is we're living in a society where abortion is legal, mm -hmm. where there are 800,000 children killed by abortion. I know you don't like calling them children, but they're human beings like you and me and they are just younger and totally defenseless. So it's this ultimate ageism or might makes right that the more powerful, the born people, are deciding the fate of these pre-born people. And so you don't like calling them persons, I, I know as well as from what you said. So I do think I would like to understand your position. When do, you're saying personhood only starts at 21 weeks because of viability, if, if, if I understand. You're saying my position is that you can, not, you can take a personhood label and put it on a human or take it off. And the history of human rights abuses have been when human beings have been called less than human. They've been called, you're not a person, you're a non-person because you're Jewish. You're a non-person because you're a person of color. You're a non-person because you're, you have a disability. That's the history of human rights abusers. And so I say, if you're a human, you are a person. There's not a question of separating the two. 
to be human is enough. And the science is conclusive. It's not a matter of my religious belief or faith or some other personal preference I have or you might have. The science is conclusive when human life begins. And a unique individual human life begins at the moment of fertilization. Well, people don't actually agree on the language of when life begins. Like, even the language is also complicated as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you wrap this up, and I'm going to move on to the next question for Lila. So go ahead and wrap up your Mm -hmm. response to her if you have anything to say. I mean, yeah, and I think I've already pretty much said it, which is that, like, I, I know people want to harp in this one thing, but all I see is, like, people running on mouse wheels with it. Because you can convince anyone that life begins at conception, but if you look even at the numbers of Christian people or people that have a religious affiliation who also get abortions, it's clear that just having that belief inside of yourself doesn't necessarily equate to the prevention of abortion or choosing not to have an abortion because of all of the myriad of issues that we're gonna get into. Okay, great. All right, so the next question, this one's going to be directed to Lila. Mm -hmm. Is it immoral to force teens and women to give birth against their will? What about bodily autonomy? I'm completely in support of bodily autonomy, the idea, and I think it's a truth that we need, we have the right to our bodies in the sense that the possession of them and nobody has the right to harm us or hurt us. Um, And we have the responsibility along with that right to not harm or hurt somebody else. And so in the case of a woman who is pregnant or a very young woman who is pregnant, she's pregnant with another, is that another human life? Is that another small little human being in there? And it is, the science is very clear. This is not something we can kind of create nuance where there's not, it's crystal clear when there's an abortion, it's being done to destroy, it's designed to destroy that embryo or that developing child because if it doesn't do that, the pregnancy will continue and the child may be carried to term. So the abortion is designed to end a life. That's what abortionists do. They they end a heartbeat. That's how they know the abortion has been completed. They have to take the, the body parts, this is graphic, but take the body parts after the, the abortion procedure to confirm that they have all the body parts removed of that developing baby. And then they know it's done. Or if the body parts aren't there, maybe it's not done. And there are actually missed abortions where sometimes a woman can go in for an abortion and they don't complete the abortion and she still has a heartbeat afterwards. That baby is still alive. So she has to go back to get the abortion completed. The job of the abortionist is to kill. So back to the question that you ask, Ellen, reproduction has already taken place. In a pregnancy, there are two people and both deserve care and support. And that is the pro-life position. Okay, Brenda. We're brought to you today by Buffy. I can say without a doubt that Buffy enhances my sleep. And every time a friend or guest lays down in these sheets and comforter, because I also have them set up in our Ahana, they are blown away how soft and cozy it is. Buffy is dedicated to making a positive impact on not only our sleep, but also the environment, using only renewable and recycled materials, which makes them as soft on the planet as they are on your bed. The Cloud Comforter is covered in ultra-breathable eucalyptus fabric, which uses 10 times less water than cotton to grow, and its fiber is produced using recyclable, earth-friendly solvents. Eucalyptus also naturally soothes the skin for an incredible, relaxing night's sleep. The best part for me, though, is that the average down comforter harms 12 geese, but Buffy's comforter is cruelty-free, using 100% recycled water bottles that are transformed and given a second life as super fluffy fiber. It feels even softer than down while keeping approximately 50 bottles out of landfills and oceans. This comforter has over 18,000 five-star reviews and keeps you at the perfect temperature so you feel cozy without overheating. It's hypoallergenic and machine washable thanks to an innovative stitching pattern that keeps its fluffy fill in place. So use my code Ellen for $20 off orders over $80. You can try a comforter in your own bed for free. If you don't love it, return it at no cost. I disagree that um, providers who provide abortion are there to kill. I believe they are there to provide a service that will afford the pregnant person the bodily God-given autonomy that they have. I am always really off-put, and I feel that it is almost egregious or maybe my side just doesn't go to the same behavior and that's what I don't like. Seeing all of these violent images and the violent descriptors of how it goes down are purposely used to incite people into fear and into sadness and sorrow and heartbreak, depression, whatever those images will elicit in you. 
I have not seen anyone showing photos of all of the children that are killed to gun violence. Like I was listening to um, an NPR episode the other day with an uh, interview with doctors that are in surgery after these mass shootings and describing the difference between the bullets in a young person's body with a 22 caliber versus an assault rifle and how impossible it is to save them. And one of the surgeons said, if we would just release these photos, this whole discussion would end. So in a way, I'm like, well, what a powerful thing to show. You're showing the violence of it, but there is so much additional violence because when we look at all of these stories from not so long ago in the 70s, and they're still happening all over the world today, in El Salvador, for example, suicide is the number one uh, cause of death for pregnant teenagers. And throughout the 70s and throughout all of time in um, the US when people were having difficulty getting legal abortions, they were committing violent acts against their own bodies to make that happen. Coat hangers, um, drinking substances that would like poison them. They made their, their selves un infertile in those cases. They bled out in hotel rooms. There is so much violence around this debate that is not only the fetuses. And this is the thing that really rubs me the wrong way. These are the issues. And like, I wish this wasn't political, but it is. Because there are people on the Republican side, their values of saving life and protecting life and preserving it, when we have all the statistics and all the information to show how to make this place hospitable to life, how to prevent abortions, they don't go for that. They're constantly legislating against comprehensive sex ed. They're constantly fighting to keep assault rifles in people's hands. And no one on my camp is talking or showing displays or holding posters of the atrocious violence that women endure, pregnant people endure, when they are giving themselves an unsafe abortion. OK, go ahead and wrap it up, and I'll let okay. Lila respond. So all of that said, like, I want you to consider what kind of desperation would drive a teenager to commit suicide in lieu of having a baby? What sort of desperation would cause someone to drink poison, to risk their own life? To Abuse bleed out and in a coercion, hotel room? usually, Brenda. Which is why, which is again, violence to solve violence only From continues who? a circle of violence. Abusive situations, abusive parents, That's not abusive boyfriends. That's the only reason women get abortions. I was well, you're, you're, into an abortion, but it was still an autonomous choice that I made. It really was. So you were. I mean, that's not the only way people have abortions. Mm -hmm. A reason for it. So I want to respond to a number of things that you said because yeah. there's a, there is a lot in there, and I think. We have to, I think, take one piece at a time to really find, can we you know, present, resolve one piece at a time? And so one of the things that you said was that um, showing images of children killed by abortion, because I was describing how abortions actually take place. And you're saying showing images of abortion is violence, And if I understood you correctly. And I was showing those violent images. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it's very hard to understand how you can say that the image is violent, but the act is not violent how you can say that it's worse for someone to have to grapple with the fact that abortion is violence and that the child had to endure that violence. Because that is a child that was torn apart that should have had the chance to live. And that's why, that's why I'm pro-life, that's why I'm here. And so we can spend a lot of time circling the wagons and say, well, what about uh, you know, poor, poor me, I'm, a, I'm a, an adult who survived birth, I'm, I'm living, I'm in this world, and I have to put up with learning about how babies are killed in abortion not poor us, we have a responsibility then to do something to, to lower the abortion rate, to help those yeah. children and to help their mothers. So that's one thing. And then, you know, there are a lot of other things in there that you said, you started talking about comprehensive sex education. You said, well, why can't we, I think that your comment was, um, we should be talking more about that or talking about solutions. And I agree, we, we, those are all things to be discussing. But as long as we are actively as a society, not just legalizing abortionists to go out there and profit from killing children, dismembering them, suctioning them to death, ha having them poisoned to death. And as long as it's even being paid for by the state in many cases, like here in California, that's, that's the bloodshed. That's the, the biggest human rights abuse in our society today. So we need more voices on that. We need more people fighting that. And until we can agree to finally stop that violence, it's going to be hard to make the progress we need to make on the other issues. 
we are making that progress. I mean, live action is for child tax credit and working to support pregnancy resource centers, get them more of the support that they need so that they can help more families. But there's bloodshed happening today in our cities. And we need to come together to stop that. So Brenda, I want you to reply to that. And then after that, can you address a little bit more clearly if it is morally conflicting to have this view that you said that mm -hmm. you're talking about with, you know, babies and their inherent human rights, but then also if there's anything morally conflicting about forcing women mm -hmm. to give birth against her will. But go ahead and answer her first and then maybe you can address that a little bit more. I just feel like you just skirted so much, which is frustrating. And also <sighs> What did I there's skirt? Like, that there's I, inciting. What, what exactly did I skirt? Because I, well, I want to. A lot I, of it. I said, I, yeah. I did not say, mm -hmm. I, and I did, like, I'm sorry if it was misperceived, but mm -hmm. I am not saying, poor me, I don't want to be assaulted by those images. I'm saying. Well, you're that, saying that we shouldn't show those images because it's no, somehow. No, I didn't say that. Okay. I was saying that your camp mm -hmm. is always putting out those images. Do you think that's wrong? to share the truth about what abortion does to that baby. I feel neutral about it, to be honest. I, I, I think- what it, the, You didn't seem neutral just a few moments ago. Well, the point it. that I'm trying to mm -hmm. make is that those images are accessible and they're one of the main tools being used to scare people out of abortion. There's also a lot of inciting description and language that is not always based in fact and reality. What's that an I'm example? Opposed to. The idea that doctors are going in and dismembering the body. That's how a second trimester abortion takes place. They are it's live first injected with... Uh, not, in, not in many cases, no. Planned Parenthood doesn't use dejection in most of their abortions. I mean, I had a Planned Parenthood abortion, so I was... Did you have a second trimester Planned Parenthood no. abortion? Planned Parenthood in their second trimester abortions typically does not use digoxin. They do not do an injection first. So typically, will they use suction? They'll use a suction instrument to help with the process of the dismemberment process of the baby. And, you know, we actually have a series out that's narrated by former abortionists so that they've actually done these procedures. They're experts, and they describe what happens in a D&E second trimester abortion. Well, this is where you and I would find common ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, not really, because you'll be anti-abortion exclusively. But for me, I am not... I think the position being taken that there's some like evil, nefarious group of people that just like loves killing babies, and they're being dismembered in these violent ways. Have you heard of Kermit Gosnell? Oh, one second. So <laughs> these ideas that there's just like that, that would be evil, honestly. And the way that we can like agree or like get on the same page is to say that if these procedures are being done, they do need to be done with absolute care and to make sure that it's causing the least amount of pain as possible. I don't, I don't want to see abortions be violent in that way. And I don't know enough about that. I'm also not like... I favor Planned Parenthood because they're one of the only nation or the only not options in our nation for women to get the care that they need in a lot of cases, um, especially when you don't have health care and all that all that stuff. So I am just saying that when you are showing these images, that fine, we can agree they're violent. I can agree with you that these procedures are not being done well in some cases. Like if you give me that information, I read it and I see it and I talk to people, I'm always receptive to that. So, and I don't think that's right. So just to understand, you're okay with an abortion, like an alive dismemberment abortion. You would be okay to, to dismember that baby provided it was injected into the heart with a substance that is actually used for lethal Ex lethal injections in execution, state executions, you would be okay with injecting that, piercing that baby's soft body tissue into the heart with a, with a substance that stops its, his or her heart, and then after the heart hopefully has stopped beating, then it's okay to start the, the dismemberment process. That's okay with you, but it's not okay if the injection hasn't been done first. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think that sounds like the more humane way so, to so do So are it. you opposed to the death penalty? Yes, but then how I, can you goes, how can you be how I can really you support wanna, that when how can you support giving a lethal injection to a developing baby because, when you're opposed to giving it to even a, a you know a prisoner who's been tried in a court of law for heinous crimes? Because this goes back to the question that I felt was skirted, which mm -hmm. is that 
the violent images that aren't being shown are babies riddled with assault rifle bullets, or... I, I'm opposed to that, Brenda. I, I don't know if you, how you think of my position, but I think that it's horrific, the violence against school children and children in our country and what guns are used for. I think it is horrific. It's mind-numbingly horrific. So we agree on that. I'm talking about the baby that you just said you were okay with being killed in the second trimester as long as its body is pierced with a needle and its heart is injected with a substance that gives us a heart attack and then it's okay to dismember that baby and remove the baby from the mother. I'm trying to understand. I'm trying my, to understand how you're okay with that. Because of the circumstances, because of humanity, because of my care and love for the people that are in that circumstance. But you're against it for, um, you're, you would be against that for a convicted murderer of let's say dozens of school children, let's say it's a school shooter who's on death row, and you would say save his life because it's clear that violence against him is wrong, but because you're saying there's all this complexity now for this baby who's developing and don't save their life. Well, this brings us back to square one, the question mm -hmm. that I found so complicated because it's true. We see, we see the beginning of life differently. I believe spirit at conception. I believe life at birth. And I believe that it is humane to have a certain cap at how long you can go, which is when a baby is viable, around 20, 20, 21, 22 mm -hmm. weeks. I believe abortion should be easily accessible so that pregnant people can make that decision as early as possible, not have to travel hundreds of miles, fly through planes, jump through hoops to get the care that they need, and that that would help that process move mm -hmm. along more quickly. And also, Again, what's being skirted is, are you morally okay mm -hmm. with forcing the birth of children from children or people who have had atrocious acts committed to their own bodies? You're, you've been pregnant. I've been pregnant. I am more vehemently pro reproductive rights than I ever have been after having an abortion and having a child. It hasn't made me more on the other side. And the reason is because I implicitly understand and have experienced the toll that that takes on your body emotionally, relationally, everything that is required for you to take excellent care of that child from beginning to end. And when people are not capable of that, are not willing to do it for whatever reason, are in a society that is not hospitable to new life like ours, then it becomes a matter of why are those women dying in the hotel mm -hmm. rooms? You really quickly went to, oh, they're all being mm -hmm. abused. I think that's really minimizing. Pregnant people are very capable of making their own autonomous choices, and they don't have to be abused into it. That is not the only instance in which someone well, if makes it's that a, choice. If it's your, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow your argument here, because you're saying, if it's a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, you're, you're saying you're accusing me of forcing children to have children, and I want to respond to that. But now you're saying you're not talking about abuse. But in that situation, there was clearly abuse. Well, because any 12-year-old who's pregnant or 10-year-old, there's abuse there. That child was sexually abused. That's why they're pregnant. Yeah. So, so but I, I, I want to very much respond to your points, Brenda. I'm trying to track, you know, track this. I know you're, we're all doing this together, um, Ellen. But... Uh, there are two key things that you said that I want to respond to. The last thing you said about forcing children to have children, and then you said something else about... Um, forcing before, anyone to have children. Really. Before that, we were talking about the lethal injections for the child, and you were saying that um, uh, they're not persons, so we just define life differently. You said, I believe life... You believe life begins at a different time than I believe. And what I'm trying to say, what I'm saying is, it's not a question of our belief when human life begins. That's a scientific fact. It be begins at fertilization. You can open any biology textbook and it will tell you when a unique individual human life begins. Now you're adding an additional layer of qualification, personhood. You're saying, well, that's a philosophical, I think is what you're saying. You're saying, well, that's a philosophical question. So the science might be clear when a human life begins, but it's not clear philosophically when personhood begins. And so you're saying it might be a human, human life, but it's not a person yet. Is that, am I representing you correctly? Because it's clear when you're pregnant, you're pregnant with something. What are you pregnant with? Yeah, a spirit. Um, <laughs> so now it's a spirit? <laughs> well, these are, again, like I really... But are you okay I with killing a spirit then? I believe that energy moves. I don't think you can kill a spirit. When you're pregnant, what are you <laughs> pregnant with? <laughs> Biologically speaking. I am going to honestly veto this question. And not because... I don't want to give you the respect or dignity of answering This a, is a foundational to the entire conversation we're having. The point that I'm making is that to me it is not foundational and I know that sounds like 
uh, counter to everything that everyone says, but that is why I'm so impassioned about getting my voice into this, this muck and mire of the abortion debate, because I am sitting here at this table with you because I, I hate abortion personally. Why? And that why is, do you hate it? Because I think it happens very unnecessarily in many cases because of poverty, because mm -hmm. of a lack of education, because... But why is it bad that it happens in those cases? Because everyone should have a right to live the life that makes them most happy. Including the child right. in the womb? Or you're, who are you referring to when you say no, everyone? No, I would, I mean, if you want a really concise, clear answer, I will say yes. I prioritize the life and autonomy of the pregnant person over the in, in any case for any reason? Up until a certain point of viability, And, and yes. your point is, and, and your choice for viability which I think it comes back to, so you say you won't say when human life begins, although science is clear on that, but you're saying that it's oh, any abortion for any reason is okay up until what exact marker? I guess 21 weeks or so. Okay. And I would love for that to but go at 20, way down. But 20 weeks, it doesn't matter how the baby's killed, it doesn't matter what happens, that baby at 20 weeks is no, not... No, I already told you, I, it, it has to be done in a humane why? way. Why? Why if it's not a, if it's not a person, if it's not a human life even, as you say, why does it matter? Because we're all human beings, we're all... But you just said it's not a human being. Okay, so... I, I'm I trying mean, to understand. Yeah. Oh, but no, no, you know what, yeah. though? I do want to say the next question is actually more related to the specific thing, but before mm -hmm. we move on, can you address my first question, which you did kind of address, but Brenda felt like you kind of skirted mm -hmm. and it would be nice yeah. to just answer a little bit more clearly yes. about like, is it morally conflicting mm -hmm. though to have yeah. that, you know, to have this view of like personhood and the value mm -hmm. of baby of a baby in the womb. Mm -hmm. But what about like her example of like yeah. a 12 year old child who mm -hmm. is pregnant? Like, does yeah. that feel morally conflicting to like force that, that child yeah. to give birth? I think that in that case, there's seriously likely abuse or incest sexual abuse certainly, if not incest in that situation. And the solution to rape or incest is not to add homicide, it's not to add violence against another innocent third party, which is the child, as you say, of that child. They're both children. So to kill one child who's innocent is not the solution. It's not just, it's not loving. And it's adding the trauma of abortion to that girl. Sorry. I mean, you, you, you speak about birth as if it's this really horrible, hard thing. It can be very hard. I mean, it can be excruciating, right? It is excruciating. Um, you speak about it as this, you know, in this negative way. Abortion is the, first, is the forced birth of a dead child. That's what an abortion is. You're forcing early delivery of a child that's been killed. And so, you know, when we're talking about what's best for women, Abortion is never best for women, including a survivor of sexual trauma, because it's adding trauma, it's adding a wrong on top of the first wrong that she endured. And I think it's a, it's a reflection on the poverty of our society's care for those that are survivors of sexual violence to send them off to abortion clinics as a solution to the pain, the first pain and the first injustice that they endured. I would say that I have noticed that there are some abortion providers who do too quickly push people into, like just reiterating, like you're here to make this choice, you've already made it, let's go. I was actually treated with a lot of tender love and care when I had an abortion at Planned Parenthood. It took like nine hours and I was asked many, many times and brought into many different rooms if I was abused, if I was coerced, all of these things. but. I um, I keep losing my train of thought on the things you just said. Um, gosh, I'm so sorry. No, it's all good. Um, oh, there was a certain. Can you remind me of some of the last things? We you were just, just said? talking about um, abortion as in cases of rape and incest. Oh, yeah. And I I'm very sorry about for your abortion. I know you mentioned earlier it was connected to coercion as well for you. It's a double yeah. double point. And I'm I'm sorry for the loss of your baby. And I'm sorry for what you endured in that relationship. And it's okay because it was a very expansive experience and it taught me a lot about abortion and pregnancy and life. Like having had both those experiences, mm -hmm. this has elevated my compassion and my ability to empathize and understand what other people are going through. So I'm like kind of feeling embarrassed that I'm flubbing so many of my words, but a lot of it is because the terminology in so many ways has been so disagreeable and is intentionally inflammatory or intentionally 
bolstered up. Not when not in on fact, not in my on my side. I'm not in intent- your opinion. Well, I, I think but a lot I'd, of I'd what ask you're you saying- if if you disagree with terminology that I'm using. I would encourage you to tell me what you disagree with, and we can discuss whether or not that's appropriate terminology. Because, for, for example, example yeah. if you have some outlier mm-hmm. uh, examples of babies that are dismembered before they that's not have an, a suction birth. That's not an outlier, Brenda. That's how second trimester abortions are done in this country. I mean, I'm not educated enough on it in that mm-hmm. case. But like I said, I do agree and, with and, you. And in, and in fact, in suction first trimester abortions, often the baby is dismembered during that process because of the power of the suction. So it happens in many first trimester abortions as well. Sometimes the cannula, which is the suction uh, machine that's used, the, the insert on the suction machine, the baby is small enough to fit entirely through the cannula, so it's r- ripped from the mother's womb whole, but sometimes it's a little too developed and will be torn apart in the process, which is why they usually put a sharp edge on the corner of the cannula in the process of, re- of destroying that first trimester baby. Again, the I, I know it's... I, no, I, I, I'm just saying, yeah. again, yes, mm. yes. I agree. It's like no matter what language I feel comfortable using or not, and a lot of it is me policing some of my own language because I don't want to disappoint people who have worked really hard in the the justice of reproductive health to really choose carefully the words and the language that best serve what we're trying to say. And I admittedly have not educated myself on that enough because Mm -hmm. I come from an era where just like pro-life, pro-choice, this is what it means. So this is all new for me. And all I have is my lived experience and what I have learned from talking to other people. And the thing that is really upsetting to me that I just cannot ever get over, drives me crazy, bang my head against a wall, is that I still feel you and I are going in a circle and not getting anywhere when we're talking about this. Because I asked you, but what about the violence of what women and pregnant people have done to their own They've been failed by the people around them. They need support and love. If they're facing a mental health breakdown, the solution is not to go commit violence against the unborn child. We're also brought to you today by Anima Mundi Herbals, an apothecary shop specializing in high-potency elixirs, medicinal mushrooms, and collagen boosters, owned and operated by a master herbalist from Costa Rica. Their project educates and supports true fair trade practices beyond organic farming, education, and small farmers to create remedies that benefit people from all walks of life. I'm obsessed with their happiness powder, which is an energizing and mood-boosting herbal coffee that is caffeine-free and adaptogenic. I like it served warm with plant milk and maple syrup, and it contains key herbal allies that we like to call happy herbs. Other immunity boosters in their shop include black elderberry syrup, mushroom mocha milk, and spirulina, an organic protein-rich mineralizer that tastes delicious in banana mango smoothies. But my favorite items in their shop tend to my feminine and pregnant body, collagen booster face oil, womb tea, which is perfect for pregnancy, and a rose body oil, which is just divine. Anima Mundi uses eco-friendly packaging and recyclable glass or biodegradable bags. I got an awesome discount code for you guys too, so you can enjoy this wonderful brand. Use my code Ellen15 for 15% off anything at animamundiherbals.com. That's A-N-I-M-A-M-U-N-D-I-H-E-R-B-A. A-L-S dot com. The solution is to solve the mental health crisis you're that also, the woman is facing. You're also really, really, really minimizing the trauma of sexual assault. I've also been sexually I, assaulted. It is minimizing, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinion, to just say, from a place mm-hmm. of, like, I'm perceiving, I don't know, affluence or just privilege. It is a privileged position, though, to sit here and be like, you know, if someone if someone sexually assaults you, it's your responsibility, whoever you are, no matter what age you are, to make sure that you don't do wrong now. No. I mean, that, to be fair, I, I, she I, didn't say that. Yeah, I, I, well, yeah, I would appreciate you not taking, you know, misquoting me here in, in this conversation. And I also think it's important to not... Um, ascribe, you know, make assumptions about the other person's experiences and background. Totally. I don't think that's fair. No. I would also say, you know, if you are willing to talk with um, sexual abuse survivors who felt they were forced into abortion, I've interviewed them. If you're willing to talk with sexual abuse survivors who have chosen to not have an abortion 
and are so grateful that they weren't coerced into it, that they didn't th think that they chose it and it was a good thing for them. I encourage, I've talked with them, I encourage you to talk with them. So, you know, in the world of lived experience and stories, there are endless stories and there are important stories, but what's also important is right and wrong. What's also important is human rights. And so, and that's what I bring this back to is, does the, is the life in the womb a life? Yes. Are they a human? Yes. Do all humans have human rights? Yes. And if we start to arrange our social solutions to all of the great complexities of life around fundamentally respecting human life and human rights, we're going to be a healthier, happier society, Society. period. OK, so let's wrap this up. You can respond to something. And then I'm going to ask you your next question, which is pretty similar to what we're talking about, but a little more detailed. So go ahead. Um, I do apologize. I definitely do not want to make any presumptions. But I will say that I have noticed a great deal of people from positions of privilege. Simply the privilege of not having been raped and not having that as your experience to have a strong opinion about it. I truly believe that a person who is a victim of sexual assault is the one and only person that should be making a decision on whether or not they are going to carry and have a baby. I, I think it is morally reprehensible, honestly, to not live in that experience and make a decision and a moral decision on that. It's, it's not in our right, I believe. And with that said, you're mentioning all of these experiences about people who are grateful that they didn't have an abortion, and I completely affirm that. That is absolutely true. I have talked to a gamut of people, but what you are not identifying in this particular moment is people who say the opposite. I am grateful that I had an abortion. I had an abortion with an abuser. Again, the justice system that would have made it so I would have probably had to fight my butt off to not have to share custody with that child, the power that he could have asserted over me if we had a child together, the fear and concern about whether or not my child would be safe in his care, all loomed on me because what we're both agreeing on is this society is not built in a way that people are going to be able to bring forth life with complete confidence. And also, like on that on your side of things, people so often talk about but adoption or all of these other things. Like if a rape victim doesn't want to have a baby, just put them up for adoption. I don't but think again, they say just. I think there's. I mean, ad adoption is a tremendously impactful, life-changing decision for everyone. So I, I don't, I would just push back against a lot of the characterizations that I think you're no, making. No, you're right. Of, my, my like yeah. exaggeration or my tone um, is really meant to just like enliven things. And I don't want to mm -hmm. do that because I do want to be specific about everything. But I, I have heard, though, people say it that willy-nilly, like, come on, just you know, make a TikTok or something. Just choose adoption. Choosing adoption, though, means that you are thrusting that child into a system that is not working. Okay. There are always 400,000 kids in uh, the foster care system every single day. So I'm really excited to talk about that, and we're going to get into that. Um, but let's wrap up these like foundational questions. I have a question for you. Last one I asked was for you. So this one is basically a lot of what we were talking about, and your answer has been, you know, like, in the gray because you're you know god you know, is gray it's hard to be in the gray <laughs> yeah but um the question that well, i had written there down is, there is black and white my understanding of your yeah. position just to make because we're doing foundations your position is that abortion for any reason is permissible up until 21 weeks unless medical technology develops and the baby can get more help before that to survive is my understanding but sure. at, up until <laughs> yeah. 21 weeks whatever goes is, is okay. your position. So this yeah. is going to be my, my question, which is basically what is the time or moment of distinction when a person deserves basic human rights? And so this question, like, is it purely based on age, gestational age, when a human can feel pain? Is it brain waves, a heartbeat? Is it autonomy or a certain level of cognition that matters? Or is it the moment a person takes their first breath, like you kind of mentioned? But then you also have mentioned that viability because viability has gotten earlier and earlier and earlier over decades as, you know, um, our medical um, technology has advanced. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that it will continue to get earlier and earlier? Or can the question of when human life begins be a personal question? I think that I think that there are like really great cases for some like um, I think that I'm just really like thinking about how if we made everything more accessible and it was easy 
to make that choice sooner, I would feel really comfortable diminishing that number to something even lower, you know, like 18 weeks or something. But really for me, this is a really interesting challenge to be like taken to task on exactly how I'm defining yeah. life and where it begins. And, and then we'll get into our, all and, the... And if I can comment on that too, I mean, it's because our laws do. And it's because the society's view of human life will determine our treatment of human life. And so that's why I, I know you say, well, I, it's, you know, it's gray. I don't want to get into these foundational questions, but it is the question. It is the question. And, uh, and once we have that, if we can resolve that, um, great. I mean, we, there's so many, m many more things we can go to, but you can't, you can't leave it unresolved because currently the, the pro-choice or pro-abortion side, however you want to say it, is in support of abortion, not being limited at any point in pregnancy is in support of taxpayer funding for that abortion and is in support of it across the country and even the world. So they've, they've staked out a claim. And we're saying... Well, who's they? There's, the, there's the, so much nuance on, on well, both sides. On well, I, what sides. I'm saying is the law. The law is, and the, the lobbyists behind the law, but just, just speaking strictly of the law, Which the law, law in seven states in our country permitting abortion through nine months, in California permitting it up until about 24, 25 weeks, and even after that, as long as the abortionist signs off on it and they have some reason listed, it can happen till term in California. So, I mean, that's the reality we're living in. That is the reality we're living in. So the question is, are you okay with that or not? Do we think that these are human lives or not? Because if they're not human lives and you can persuade me of that, I'm, I will, we, I'm, I'm done. You know, it's like I've devoted my life to this because uh, this is a human rights issue for our most vulnerable members of our human family. But me challenging and like, the viability or when it's like I, I get the impression, if I'm not mistaken, that I'm not going to be able to make any headway with that because you are convinced that life begins at conception. Well, I think because you're running into facts, you're running into scientific facts that you can't you can't talk away. And the scientific fact is that we don't choose or believe when human life begins. It begins biologically at the moment of fertilization. That's what in an in vitro fertilization clinic, they're looking when they say, oh, we created you seven embryos. It's that moment of sperm egg fusion when you have a single cell zygote come into existence and then the in vitro uh, you know, specialist can tell the parents, the would-be parents, oh, we've got you seven viable embryos or whatever they say, you know, do you want to implant these? It's because these are individual children of those parents and they can decide if they're going to carry them to term, right? That's the whole IVF industry in our country. It's but it's not it's not it's not even it's it should not be a debate. But I think it becomes sort of political in a strange way and even like a religious thing if it's saying, well, it's a debate. The science the science is clear. Yeah, but the science is also clear that pregnant or uh, sex can result in pregnancy. Exactly. But we cannot mandate that our entire nation wait till they have a partner that's going to support them. They practice abstinence. Like you cannot mandate that sexual activity. This world is too complex our nation is too complex the problems we have are too complex so are you opposed is, to are you opposed to child abuse of course would this, you say that the circumstances in which children are abused or not even abused neglected which is a form of abuse but in the circumstances around child neglect are complex no. Well, I mean, yeah, the circumstances that get people there, mental health, yeah. all of it. And, yeah. and some neglectful parents are victims themselves of their own addictions or their own childhood abuse cycles or other intergenerational tra trauma, right? Yeah. So, but that child who's still a victim of neglect still deserves to be cared for, right? And, and, and even intervened in that situation of the neglect that they're in, if it's severe neglect, to protect that child's life, right? Even though there's complexity all around the parents and the mother and, and everything else. Yes. But you're saying that because I agree is with like, you on Brenda, I agree with you on complexity. You, we are no, we're in I agreement there. But but what is black and white is life or death. Yeah, but you are making something black and white that not everyone agrees with. Not everyone believes that life begins at conception, and you can have science that you perceive backs that up. I do not think it's as cut and dry. I think in our nation and in our world, we have a very strange avoidance of death and what it means, and I'm a really spiritual person like I said so I believe in the spirituality of it I believe you can't kill 
um, like a spirit or an energy, that energy just moves. So there's a lot of complexity on what I feel happens when I'm housing an embryo or a fetus inside of myself. I Having that experience too, I felt it. I felt the presence of something. When I had an abortion, I felt the absence of something. I am not going to sit here and deny that at all. However, I am so frustrated mm -hmm. with the muck and mire that we're in right now because I just don't see what good it's going to do. Like, I well, in Texas, when they passed the heartbeat bill, it cut the abortion rate in half. So abortion, those people abor are going to other states, uh, they're fleeing to other places, where, where, or they're having children that they don't want, adding to the foster care system that is already overrun and not working. So, so, so you're I'm, saying it's better for a foster care child to not exist. To not, be, to not be alive. To be, to, it's better for them to be killed. Well, I'm a pro-reproductive rights activist, so yes. So you, you're saying that a child in foster care, it's better for them to be dead? Not after they're already alive. <laughs> not after but they're out of the womb. In order to abort someone, they have to be alive. Otherwise, you need to abort them. Do you, I... So I, I think, but I, I mean, there was, there was one thing I'm trying to track here. I don't know if you, you want to keep going on this route, Ellen, but there was one other um, thing that you said that I want to make sure we, we connected on. Oh, you said everybody, you said if everybody agrees, um, you know, everybody, I think you were saying everybody has uh, different views on this, uh, something to that effect, and therefore we can't resolve it. We keep going in circles, right? Is that kind of what you were saying? Well, yeah, mm -hmm. but I'm talking specifically about life beginning at conception. I actually do believe that if we could sit down and have a more nuanced, balanced conversation about when life begins and what people morally believe is right or wrong with abortion, that we could actually come to terms that would be so beneficial. Because if you and I could come to terms somehow, some way, and be like, you know what, 12 weeks is a good amount of time. We both feel comfortable with that, then we could I, I'm never. I will that. tell you right now. I'll never be comfortable with killing an innocent human. Period. But that's the thing. It's this never. Is, it's there's no. There's no argument that will justify killing an innocent. I child, get it. But period. with all due respect, I truly feel. And this, just because society supports it, I mean, I think there. I think that was the direction of your comment earlier. Is like, well, it's so great because so many people support this. There have been times in human history when people have supported the enslavement of women and children and men. They have supported uh, the sexual exploitation publicly as part of almost a state operation of children. Um, there have been empires that have rose and fall that have committed atrocities. But just because the prevailing notion might be something that's wrong doesn't mean it doesn't make it right. And that's, I think that's, I, and, and the other thing is people are changing on this. I mean, people are changing on abortion. We see it every day. So laws change behavior and save lives. And then public opinion is changed when people are educated, when they learn about the abortion procedure, when they see this through the lens of human rights, when they understand the resources that are available for women, especially low-income women or women in, in difficult situations. People change, and they don't want the violence of abortion. And that's, could, that's what I, I think is exciting. And that's what we can focus on in I have a, a positive question. world. Could she be right that with the Texas abortion ban mm -hmm. that people are just fleeing into other states and so it cutting abortion in half could maybe not be accurate? Well, I think there will absolutely always be some people, no matter the law that you pass, that will break that law or try to break the law. But there's no evidence that says that the 50% of children who have been uh, not aborted in Texas because of their abortion ban in, in the state are going out of state. It's not like 50% of all those women are, are leaving the state. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. So I think we have to look at, at, the, at the statistics. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I'm just, I'm really frustrated because I'm, I'm really trying to articulate something and I don't know how to get it through. But what I'm wanting to say is that this, idea of you believe that life begins a conception. I don't believe it, Brenda. I, it's not my personal belief. It I think is. that's a, no, it's not. I learned it in okay, but then, you know, okay. sixth grade biology <laughs> yeah, class. Yeah, but look at us. This is yeah. mouse wheels. It's we, mouse wheels because I, I don't know why it is, why you're not, I mean, I think you're not willing to acknowledge the scientific reality because it would mean that abortion would end and end a human life and you don't want to admit it. 
But I would encourage you if to it stops believe this the part of the conversation. I'm happy to say abortion ends a life. Okay. Like, well, I don't think you should say anything you don't believe. No, I think you I need mean, to believe it. It's it's not that I don't believe what I just said. It's that I literally, honestly, honest to God, see no purpose in this line of conversation. This to me is the biggest frustration. I, I agree. If you're Wait, not going to finish yeah, my sentence, yeah. please. Mm-hmm. This to me is the biggest frustration when I come to the table because mm-hmm. I am telling you for the at umpteenth mm-hmm. time, I am here to prevent abortion because I don't like abortion. And I would like for those numbers to decrease or in some magical land be completely eradicated. Not every person believes the same way that I do. Some people in my camp would think that's a little extreme and they want me to feel less moralistic or less emotional about it, but I do. And I feel comfortable sitting in that gray and saying, I don't feel comfortable with this. So what does that do? That propels me into an obsession, an absolute obsession with figuring out how we make this place hospitable to new life. You and I deciding or arguing about biology class, it gets us nowhere. I don't see this going anywhere. All it's going to do is have viewers be like, Lila said all the right facts and Brenda stumbled around because she doesn't know the proper words. And we've solved nothing except make both camps feel like nice and tidy that they're on the right side of things. Okay. You I, finish I, up. I want to, I have a perfect question for you after what you just said, because I yeah. do think that you speak to what a lot of pro-choice people feel. Mm-hmm. Um, most pro-choice people, when you ask them why they're pro-choice, they say, I wouldn't personally get an abortion mm-hmm. because like you said, I think you're right that a lot of people who are pro-choice aren't like championing it, championing it, championing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they say, but I personally, I wouldn't want to force or restrict someone else from ending a pregnancy, keeping a pregnancy that they didn't want. Why is that not good enough for you? That seems to be a lot of people's stance. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to respond to what Brenda just said too. So I'll start with what yeah. you just said, Alan. Um, I would say, I mean, I say is you can have a personal opposition to something, you know, let's say I'm personally opposed to child abuse, but it would be wrong for you to say, okay, but I'm not going to tell somebody else how to treat their child. Some That's things, not a fair some things, comparison some, at all. Well, I, I think it is a fair comparison if you acknowledge the science of when life begins and you acknowledge that we're talking about a human life. And I think human lives are precious and they have rights. And so, you know, I think our personal belief around something um, does matter, but we also have to acknowledge things that are outside of our personal beliefs, which are both science and moral law around human rights. Thoughts? I also want to respond to what Brenda said. Earlier. Okay. Go but I don't know if you want no, to respond yeah, first. Go for it. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, and then to your other point, Brenda, which I think um, you, were, you were sharing about how you want to have an obsession on making life better for people, um, which I think is beautiful. I, the, the starting point in my book and the reason that I'm working to educate every day about what abortion actually is, connect women to the resources that are out there, is that we cannot have a culture of life we really people flourish if we literally in our communities have centers set up where people are killing preborn children and and that's that that, that is a culture of death by definition there's so and so, many other cultures of death in our society though that I make agree that there's a necessity for people I agree with you there's a lot of other I agree with you I'm going to push back a little on the necessity word because I think women are a lot more uh capable than we give them credit for a lot of the time and there's a lot more resources that do exist and i think fear is a big part of a lot of abortions fear of the future um fear of the repercussions and so i think part of, of it those is fears are legitimate i, I i'm not speaking if your child to, is going into an abusive foster care system like that fear is mm-hmm. legitimate it's based on a, a reality it's based on a fact if you are a black this, woman this, mm-hmm. in louisiana being forced to give birth and one of that they have the number one highest maternal death rate in our nation. And, and you think abortion is helping women, more women give birth health, healthfully? I mean, that it, no, it doesn't I make think, sense. I think that if you are hypothetically a black, I mean, I don't abortion speak for doesn't any black improve women. maternal mortality rates for for black women. Yes, but I'm it, talking it, about it, the necessity it hurts them of more abortion than or this fear. Mm-hmm. Like you can't minimize or say that people I'm not, are just in fear. I know you're. I'm not yeah. trying to imply you're minimizing <laughs> anything, but I'm saying to just say, well, people are resilient and they can actually do better. When I have 
a society around me, a nation, and a party that claims to be pro-life but does so many things that actually result in the opposite, like these are not just fears. These are valid, valid concerns that are happening every single day. The highest maternal death rates in this country happen to be in states that are wanting to force birth. Louisiana, Texas, there's many others, Jersey, they're not all even just pro-life so-called so states. And we're not even focusing on a maternal death rate problem or the maternal death rate of black women. So it's not that abortion has to be a necessity, and I can understand why you'd push back on that. However, if you already have children, which is the majority of people who seek out abortions, and you're worried about poverty, which is valid, and you're seeing your children not be able to eat, and you're seeing all these systemic problems, your kids are getting shot in school, these are not just fears. These are valid concerns that cause people to say, you know what, I don't want to bring a baby into this inhospitable place where I might die. There, it's going to take our entire nation, our unity, um, to solve that. And that's why I got so frustrated, and I still feel that frustration inside of me on what I'm calling the mouse wheel. Because our aligning and deciding we agree when life begins will not also change my stance on what needs to happen and that abortion needs to be accessible until we can make sure those freaking women aren't dying out there. And... I, I think we're in agreement that there is a death culture in our country, a culture that is often very inhabitable to human flourishing, and it's all hands on deck. It's in how we treat each other. It's in how we treat our own families that we're given or we're born into or, or chosen families. It's in you know the communities we're part of and how we're helping our neighbors. There's a, a lot there to unpack. But how, I, I, I can't, it, it, it is, um, I think, impossible to achieve, I think, the society you're dreaming of. And I agree, I, I'm united with you in a society that's open to human life flourishing, human beings can flourish, while permitting the violent act of abortion against our youngest and most vulnerable members. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to say, I can't give you that point to say, oh, it's okay to just kill them in the womb as long as they're 20 weeks, not 21 weeks, and then we're gonna go out and make life better for everybody else. I, we can't those two things can't hold together. We need to say all life is precious and set the tone right from the beginning yeah, but and I then think act it has on to that. Go in reverse because until this mm -hmm. place is hospitable, like every place that so prioritizes its citizens, prioritizes comprehensive sex ed from five years old, prioritizes access mm -hmm. to birth control, prioritizes not killing its citizens through gunfire, the myriad of things, prioritizes maternal health and making sure women don't die in birth. The nations that do that have lower rates of abortion than we do in this country because I, why? Why wouldn't you then? Like, then you would actually have to have another reason. Then you would jump to another thing. Like, to me, the true tragedy is that many people go into those abortion clinics and they are there out of a necessity that is not just perceived, it is valid and real. And we are not focusing on how to make it hospitable for them. Like, I agree with well, you. Do, that how life, is the abortion clinic making it hospitable for them? I think, I, I think this is where we I, agree, but we also disagree profoundly in that I I am all, and, and most of the work of the pro-life movement, I don't know how familiar you are with the pro-life movement. I know there's a lot of stereotypes, especially among you know the, the pro-choice abortion side that s likes to think of the pro-life movement in a certain way. But the pro-life movement that I'm a part of is day in and day out supporting women and young families and children in communities through helping you get involved in the foster care system to make it better. I have many friends active in fostering, organizations active in fostering to support healthier outcomes for those kids, make life better for them, helping women who are unexpectedly pregnant, help them with the material resources that they need, um, helping make adoption as positive as possible because it is a beautiful thing. It can be very challenging, but it can also be really beautiful. There's a lot there that's beautiful that I'd love to explore with you, but I still cannot see it and we cannot accept killing a child as somehow the foundation of this beautiful culture of life that we want to build together. Maybe the question is like, I, I again, do you hate that it's political because I don't like to be divided and that becomes black and white as well, Democrat, Republican, but I am curious if I could ask a political affiliation or if there is anything, any relevance in that to you because it's not like a misconception that pro-lifers, so-called, tend to be in the Republican camp. 
like Donald Trump was a pro-lifer, so-called, all of that stuff. So I'm used to seeing these people who I are legislating yeah. for the removal of bodily autonomy, the removal of reproductive rights, also simultaneously being vehemently against comprehensive sex ed and going on channels and instigating all of this fear and fear mongering around they're going to teach your kid anal sex at five years old and all of this stuff to make people afraid. I also know a lot of these states that are trying to legislate forced birth are also trying to get rid of birth control and get rid of access to women's health in general and again not even looking or taking care of their maternal death problems. So I think it is important to get into that because I can respect you very much so if you tell me, look, I'm here on the ground, I have this personal belief system that I believe is fact, that I don't believe is fact, but you know, you have your own belief and you have built your entire life around that. And in doing so, the work that you're doing may be beautiful and you may be instigating a lot of beautiful change in society in the small pockets of people that you have access to, even if it's a lot of people. The larger question for me then becomes, but what do we do as a larger society? Because we're talking about legislation, we're talking about the Supreme Court and Roe versus Wade. So this isn't just about like community. We don't even have infrastructure of good community. Like my dad taught in inner city Philly to exclusively black and brown students while I sat in my middle class class. Um, that was exclusively white. And the disparities between the way we have redlined and treated some communities and put them on the outskirts, which I'm sure you are incredibly familiar with, mm -hmm. with the work that you do, has again made such a level of inhabitability for people and such a level of egregious poverty and pain that I just don't see how we can address this issue without addressing the fact that these values that people espouse or seem to have don't align with making policies that will statistically, provably, decrease abortion rates and help mediate this problem. So before you reply, do you, this is like exactly a question I was gonna ask you, is do you think that the way we talk about this debate, pro-life and pro-choice, is accurate and descriptive to how people who hold those views truly think and act? It sounds like you don't think so. <laughs> Absolutely not. Because you feel, not. you kind of label like pro-life as Republicans and pro-choice are Democrats, and so therefore they don't, you know, Republic, Republicans don't care, Democrats do care. What, what do you think? Yeah, and I'm sure you could already intuit my resistance to that. I don't, again, being in the gray, I don't ever look at someone and be like, oh, you're a Republican, this means X, Y, Z. Yeah. You're pro-life yeah. or choice, and that right. means X, Y, and Z. And I also think that that does a great disservice as well, because I think attention-grabbing headlines do a lot of work that can be so counterproductive because in getting someone's attention in a society that has like an attention deficit and will only read a headline and they won't get into the mire of like but wait did this really help prevent abortion is this really doing a good service to the community and the people involved like and then also having these these ideas about one side being evil mm -hmm. we're baby killers you are you know, you don't care about life outside of the womb. We all have these stereotypes of each other. And then when you talk to people on the ground, which you and I both do, you find that is not true. That people run the gamut mm -hmm. on the reasons they have abortion, the reasons they don't or wouldn't, the reasons they vote the way that they do. But there's so much fallacy, so many misnomers. I mean, not only with the abortion debate, but also just in like women's health in general. Like me having, what is it called when you're... <laughs> Old ass pregnancy, over 35, you are a I don't know. geriatric pregnancy. Oh. There's a lot of misnomers in the medical field that I think we have to work through and I try my best to honor. All of that said, with all of that complication, I am not at all seeing an alignment between values and legislation. And I am not at all seeing an alignment between being, quote, pro-life, but really, like really, to the truest sense of the word pro-life, overturning Roe v. Wade is not pro-life because it's going to cause so much more death. It's going to cause so much more heartbreak because these same legislators won't legislate things that actually improve the society and make it again, hospitable for life. Okay, Lila, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I disagree. I think uh, <clears throat> there's a lot that you just said, so to try to boil down some of it, um, 
if there are centers in our communities where there are doctors who are killing human beings for profit, which is what they do for money, and well, we don't have universal we, healthcare, so we, we just have to pay for it. Well, then the taxpayers will be paying for it, but regardless, um, that that's a culture of death. So that's 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 violence against the most vulnerable members of our population. What, so I know you've said so, this. Like, what about everything else? Well, you just what? Said? But I I, I want to address that. But I, I think there's a fundamental. There is obviously a fundamental disagreement. You're not acknowledging them as human beings. They're just sort of maybe you mentioned spirits or. Well, why I don't know. is it so important for you to get me there? Because I think this is a conversation about human rights, and I do there too. is a whole there is a whole uh, apparatus that legally that has succeeded in removing the human rights of a whole group of people simply because they're not born yet. And that's one of the reasons I agreed to come here today because I'm advocating for their right to just exist, their right to be born. Born into what? And, and let's, we can talk about the world, but you got, the first right is to, be, is, to, is to live. That's the first right. Okay, so what about that all the, the other things right. that she said? So, and, and all the other things, I think we'd probably agree on a lot. I don't know what, you know. I think so too. Yeah, that's so the point I'm we, always trying to but, make. But, I, but we can agree on a lot. Like I could sit down with someone and sit down with you and we can agree on a lot about, you know, women deserve health care. I mean, you know, pregnant mothers deserve the best care that they can, we can pr pr um, provide as a society. So how does that happen? Um, and, like, we, do, are you a champion of universal health Healthcare? I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, disagreements about how we can get there. I think we have to really focus. I'm a big believer of, if you want to talk about the theory here, subsidiarity. So making the community as responsible for each other as possible. So the kind of top down, you know, at the federal level push for how communities, individual communities should behave usually gets into a lot of um, trouble and issues. But I would say, yes, we need to ensure in our communities that women have health care. I think there's right now a, a starting place is making sure that taxpayer dollars are being rerouted away from abortion to provide actual prenatal care for mothers. But what about I think all that's the a, other, that's a first well, step. But what what federal and we've and I've for advocated for that that um, uh, publicly many times. I don't abortion know if you're aware. Abortion is provided by our society, though. You have to pay for uh, it. Plan, that's not completely accurate. In many states, uh, abortion is paid for by the state for low-income women, and Planned Parenthood is the recipient of over half a billion dollars in uh, federal tax dollars every single year. So as an immediate public policy solution, I'd say reroute that money to provide free so and comprehensive one prenatal care. care to amend another. No, How because killing a human being is not health care. And we can keep going in circles. But no, because killing a human being is not health care. So, but caring for that human being and their mother is health care. And I would absolutely advocate for that. Well, let's talk about health care for a second. Because, and, again, my experience is that I had a job. I was paying $365 a month for my health care. When I got pregnant, I was going to lose my job because I was modeling, so can't maintain the normal body uh, that would be required. And my insurance company quoted me $6,000 to $120,000 for the entire process of prenatal care, post, all of that. Which would have I wish me... I had been in touch with you because I could have connected you to a doctor who would have done it for, for you for free. And that's where was that accessible to like everybody? It, if, if if you're if you're struggling to pay your bills and you're a pregnant woman, I will connect you. And please, if someone's listening to this, and this is a, if someone's listening to this and they are considering abortion because they're struggling to pay medical bills, please contact us. We will connect you with direct payment for your medical bills so that you do not have to have an abortion. Don't you, do you not wish feel that you wasn't on abortion. your shoulders? Like, don't, well, you just don't. said we should take these problems on your shoulders, though. No, I mean, I, I, I feel like I wish our society took mm -hmm. care of us. I wish America was what I believed that it was going to be when I well, was little. I think the difference is that, like, one side, you know, I don't want to push it to, like, both camps extremes like that, but there's differences of opinion on whether it's the most helpful for the government to delegate all the yeah. tax dollars and all the, all the ways to help people, or if we should have more of a focus and an emphasis towards valuing helping others I think in it's our a community. Mix. Right. I think it's a mix, yeah. and I think that we can't make it all or the, or one. I think there's um, it's complex, and different communities are different, but it is a mix. And I think that we have some social safety nets, but I would passionately support, and I do, and Live Action does, the networks of support that exist and are growing for young families, especially low-income families and young mothers. Well, so is that sufficient? Middle class families. Because middle class people have the and most those difficult two, time Those paying. two, Brenda. Those two. I mean, 
Yeah. Would that it would that be a sufficient way to move forward instead of focusing on like tax dollars doing something like that? Um, because some people disagree that like tax do- that tax dollars are spent very efficiently or wisely. And yeah. so would something like a nonprofit like this trying to help women who are suffering? I mean, as an example, there's would Obria, that be something there's like Obria Medical Clinics. I've served on their advisory board and we've worked closely with them in the past. And they have been working over the years aggressively to try to create a national brand. So it's recognizable. It's easy for women to know they exist. Because I think what you just said, you said, I didn't know, like you didn't know that there was someone who could have helped maybe pay those bills if you knew who to email or who to, you know, what hotline to call. And that's a tragedy, you know, because those resources do exist. And so, you know, one, one example of this is Obria Medical Clinics, which are pro-life clinics providing prenatal care, uh, care for, for uh, health care for women, providing also resources when you've had your baby, um, financial support, uh, even parenting classes. I mean, a whole gamut of support for a woman who might be in a, in a situation of need. Uh, or or young men, families, it can, it can be for both. And what's so tragic is they've had a struggle to even get taxpayer dollars, some of which are going under the same grant fund to Planned Parenthood, because why? They're pro-life. So, you know, we're in a society where you're saying, well, the government needs to do more. The government right now is blinded, our, especially our current administration, as by the lethal killing of children as a solution to problems. And so a lot of the, the air in the room and the funding is going that direction as opposed to going towards pro-life solutions for mothers and children. I mean, this makes children. me sad because why do we just have to funnel in one direction or the other? Like, right, I, it could I, be both. Yeah, like I, it should be both, in my opinion. It should absolutely be both. We shouldn't have to be like taking this little slice of pie and being like, please give it to us. No, please give it to us. It's just like women's health care, pregnant people's health care should be top, top, top tier priority. Again, we are not addressing the maternal death. Mm-hmm. Well, I in think this what country. she's saying when when I said it could be both, I think just to be clear, so we're on the same page. We're talking that it could be tax dollars, and it also could be private organizations helping. I right? Mean, are I, you are you for that? Well, for the record, I would like to say this kind of conversational attitude gets me going. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, now yeah. we're going somewhere. Like yeah. this is meaningful to me because yeah. what it shows is like. This is what I want to talk about. Well, I, How do lot- we protect women who are pregnant? How do we protect people in these circumstances? Yeah. How do we yes. let them know what funds are available to them? What's the best governmental pro- program to help make sure that we are taking care of these people? If we were arguing about that, like what's the best way to save black women from dying in childbirth? I would scream all day with someone about that if we were talking about like legislation solutions. and solution. like. This is meaningful to me. This, to me, is where we will intersect and actually start solving these issues. Okay, Lila, Mm -hmm. to kind of address, she brought up a great point about all these specific issues, and you in live action are doing a lot to help. Like, you're explaining your specific Mm -hmm. instances where you're helping Mm -hmm. individuals and communities. Um, But since there was literally, there's a lot of, like, issues that she brought up. You can't Mm -hmm. take on the burden of all of it. And, like, what she's bringing up, you know, there was over 600,000 abortions last year. It sounds like you want to ban all abortions from happening so that would be 600,000 more kids a lot of them in poverty and in tough situations so I, the question is, what is your plan to deal with that? Mm-hmm. But that's not fair because, yeah. like, what you said is like that can't all be on your shoulders. Well, it is I know, fair. I, this oh, is what her whole life well, is based on. Well, no, that I like, want to start by just saying, and to anyone listening right now, you can be against and proudly be against lethal violence against a developing child in the womb and not feel like you have to go out at the same time and magically on your own solve every social ill that we face because we face many. You can be proudly against lethal violence against children and not feel like you can't be against it unless you go out and solve every social ill in the world. That said, um, the social ills deserve attention, the greatest of which is abortion because it's the killing of (laughs) over 800,000 children (laughs) a year. Our other social ills deserve attention. I don't know if you kind of follow what I say online, but I I occasionally speak out against other social ills that I perceive um, and I'm concerned about. Live Action certainly is involved, again, in connecting women to support and resources. Our primary focus is education because I have found that sometimes it is simply education, having awareness of your own the, the, the development of your own pregnancy, the development of that child, the facts about the abortion procedure that can mean life or death for that child, and what the lifelong sex education, and the lifelong to just finish, and the lifelong regret of abortion that many women experience. That simply education on abortion procedures, its risks, and the development of the child can mean life or death for the child, and mean 
avoiding a lifetime of pain and regret for a mother. So I think that that is fear. I think that's my opinion. So you're saying women don't regret abortions because I can introduce you to I'm just saying hundreds of educating people on a certain lived experience that not everybody shares and presenting it as the thing that happens and also so you going to the most extreme cases like mm-hmm. showing aborted fetuses that are later in term to like just it's bringing attention to me to in, like inciting things inciting fear inciting emotion versus to me education is educating people on their body, their personhood, their consent, how to have sexual integrity, how to not rape, how to heal from sexual trauma so that they don't perpetuate that sexual trauma onto other people. Sex education, basic fundamental ideas of how you're getting pregnant. These same states Mm -hmm. that are trying to enforce birth also have the highest rates of teen pregnancy and STD because they refuse to educate their kids on how you get freaking pregnant and that leads to mm-hmm. so many abortions so i i would just push back on, on multiple things that you just said um okay. i think there's some inaccuracies there but j- just on the last thing that you said which is you started talking about sexual um sex education mm-hmm. before going to that which is another topic we can discuss um you started off you know you were responding to by saying to tell a woman about the abortion procedure you said is somehow, I think this is what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is somehow fear, you know, instilling fear in them. And I, it's baffling to me, quite frankly, because I, I think informed consent, even if you're an abortionist, you know, and, and you should at least, your patient deserves to know what that abortion procedure entails. You say it entails. with so, so much emotionality. You're uh, like, and this... So I, can, would, I would direct you to the resource we use, because the, the primary resource that we use are medical professionals, former abortionists, explaining the abortion procedure and medically accurate depictions of the abortion procedures. And those are the primary vehicle that we use along with, you know, stories. But you're the figurehead. So this is the kind of information. So you're saying I can't. So I'm trying to understand. So you're saying that it's wrong to be passionate against violent act against children because that would instill fear in someone? No, and I think it's wrong and misleading to say that there's only one experience that people have of abortion. And there's only, I didn't say that, Brenda. Well, okay. So mm-hmm. I think it's wrong to present one idea at, that it's sad, that it's tragic, that it causes It is sad. A child is, is, it doesn't have a life in front of front of him or her that but there he or is she would have a had. there's like a medical way to do it in which you present the facts and people can there's decide a medical way to kill someone yes. nationality about it yeah. because I mean, not everybody feels the same way about I, I, it. yeah we're not gonna we're gonna keep going in circles here because you're saying well if it's okay. done in a medical setting and if it's not done not 21 weeks but at 19 or 15 i mean if you were getting cancer treatments and the doctor came in like flailing his arms and was really emotional about it that's not the way you give people facts and information about i don't know anyone flailing their arms so i i'm not following you as the figurehead that's the kind of information education you're giving people by expressing it in that way i think you're not everyone's shared experience i I think you're misrepresenting our how we educate okay so i'm going to move forward to the next question um you have this is for you brenda you have said that you're pro-choice because of your faith what faith is that and Lila please respond with your thoughts after you share I really do believe fundamentally that we have a God-given right to our own autonomy and obviously I understand the complication because a pregnant person is then carrying something that could become a life in this world but when I look out in the world and I see things through the lens of my Christian faith, and when I see things through the lens of the way Jesus behaved and walked through this world, I see so many egregious tragedies that can be prevented all around me. I think it is exciting that so many people are waking up to all of these things that they had no idea about before. Like for me, I understood poverty and racial disparity and racism growing up just because I had a front row to segregation by means of watching my dad go to a school that he would never permit me or my brother to go to because it was dangerous. He had like four or five kids die throughout every summer and he would come and sit down with us September 8th and be like teary eyed and be like, we lost so and so, so and so, so and so to gun violence and, and hunger and different things that were happening only in this community 15 minutes away from where we lived. 
So I knew all of that, and it really wasn't until we had all of these social upsets when we were sitting at home in our houses, really marinating on everything that had happened. George Floyd was killed. I personally had so many more awakenings to what injustices are happening, what kind of white supremacy this nation is built on, how all of these things burgeoned and became the issues that they are today. And there are solves to it. Like when you looked in the camera and said, this isn't your responsibility, that might not be a quote, but it's not your responsibility, I think you said, to to take on the burden of every social ill. No, I said you can... I don't know the exact quote, but it's something like that. It's important to, to get the quote no, no, correct. Yeah, I get said right. you, that's fine. You, anyone listening, can be proud of being against lethal violence against children without feeling that they have to solve all of our social ills before being against lethal violence against children. Okay, yeah. So I agree with that, but at the same time, I worry that I'm that invites that. <laughs> complacency. Trust me, the pro-life movement that I am involved with, the thousands of activists I work with are anything but complacent. I mean, obviously, yes. But I mean complacency mm -hmm. as far as the other things. Yeah, they're, like they're, looking they're, at all of the I invite you to spend some issues. time with some of us because day in and day out, there's work on the sidewalks of abortion clinics, many of them, to connect and accompany those women to the life-changing positive resources and support that they need and deserve. And it can be life-changing and transformative yeah, for no, those Yeah, no, and I think that's beautiful. I think an individual going out and doing what they can in their own community is great. But I bring up the segregation point, too, because there are communities that are in dire need that are not getting any of the resources that we have. And the onus being put on each community to take care of themselves and hold each other's hands and like walk through these systems or have to build nonprofits around places just to fix these issues that I can see easily addressed by changing our tax laws, by changing who is getting what funds and what's important to us in the society. Our legislators, our higher ups, the Supreme Court, etc., are not properly prioritizing to me the things that would be aligned with preventing abortion. There are statistical facts on what prevents abortion, like mother effing sex education, and to watch people continually again and again rally against that, like that's what I worry about because when I don't know what you're for referring to there. I mean, I'm talking about the again the like looking exactly in the camera the moment. Because it's my projection of what I can imagine people, how I can imagine people reacting mm -hmm. to it. And that doesn't come from nothing. Just being on social media, I have learned how people respond to things, how they receive information. And with something like that, I think a lot of people feel very comfortable being like, I'm a Republican because I'm a Christian and because I believe in the right to life. And they'll celebrate what's happening in Louisiana or Texas with abortion, thinking, great, it's going to get solved. And that is the complacency that I meant, not your complacency mm -hmm. or the complacency of your organization, but the complacency of being like, great, like we have made it illegal. Now it's going to be better. There's so much statistical fact to show that that is not going to get better, that women still do seek abortion, even if it's illegal. They've done it in dire circumstance because there is not just fear around this. Again, like I said earlier, they are valid concerns that I still haven't seen addressed in the party that deems itself pro-life. And again, I don't know what po like political mm -hmm. or affiliation you have, but like, can you recognize mm -hmm. the disparity in that? Can you recognize mm -hmm. that in a state like Louisiana, if they are against comprehensive sex ed and they're doing abstinence-only education, that that is counterproductive to the work that you are attempting to do? I think we can get into a discussion on what you mean by comprehensive sex ed. And I think that absolutely, um, women and girls deserve to be educated on their fertility, on their bodies. Men I think that, too. and men should too. I agree with that. I agree with you. Um, I think that when it comes to sex education, a lot of it centers around the bio, biological act of sex, which I think is important. But I think what's most important is relationship education for healthy relationships. That's where sex happens, healthy or unhealthy relationships, yeah. and that needs to be the large focus. Unfortunately, a lot of the comprehensive sex education that you mentioned that I have looked at, especially coming from groups like Planned Parenthood, does not do that. Um, it's actually toxic and promotes uh, sexual behaviors and activities that are harmful, that lead to increased pregnancy, that lead to um, psychological, emotional problems. So we could get into a conversation on oh, that. Planned Parenthood prevents so much pregnancy by giving access to birth control that I otherwise couldn't afford if I 
because because we have you know universal health care and also that is not true I'm a mm -hmm. I'm a comprehensive sex educator myself and comprehensive sex ed is about consent it is about learning about the body it is about understanding inappropriate touch it's age appropriate throughout the ages it also is beautiful because it will help people not instigate sexual violence against one another I think Again, you want me to be really careful about the way I perceive and speak about your movement. Please do me the same honor. Comprehensive sex ed is mother effing beautiful. And it statistically delays sex by two years in countries that actually do this service to their children and teens. Because when we have a fear-based, fear-centered education around sex that is abstinence only, just wait, and doesn't give kids any information that they actually need to prevent pregnancy, STDs, it is exacerbating the problem that you are trying to solve. And this, again, is another thing. Like Now I feel like we're off the mouse wheel. Can we get off the mouse wheel and be like, can we agree that comprehensive sex education that is age appropriate, that does include relationship and honoring of one another, is something that we should have nationwide so that the problem that you're trying to address isn't as enormous as you're dealing with right now? So you mentioned Planned Parenthood's comprehensive sex education. And just I think, so you know, I'm not um, hanging my hat on Planned Parenthood. Like, well, you just I'd said rather, you loved them. You said earlier I think you loved them. So I'm, I'm trying to understand what you mean. I appreciate I, what they've done for me because mm -hmm. they were the only access to women's health that I had when I needed it when I was living in poverty mm -hmm. myself. They have been the only option, and that is why I support them. But mm -hmm. I have conflicts about them. So just for the record, like I have no interest in getting into like a Planned Parenthood specific discussion because well, I'm they're not one a of champion. the leading they're one of the leading educators um, of or promoters of a certain kind of comprehensive sex education, and they actually have a. Uh, like what approach leads that they to uh, well, dangerous sexual activity? I, I can speak to that if you'd like. Of yeah. What Planned Parenthood's comprehensive sex education, as they say it, um, is very harmful about it. So um, some of it encourages sexual exploration, you could say, among very young children, um, even sexual exploration among um, first grade, second grade, exploring your exploring genitals. Exploring of your own body. Um, well, most girls... Towards pleasure, towards pleasure to try to encourage basically the mas masturbation of young children. Um, yeah, it but encourages, they masturbate no matter what. It encourages... I started masturbating when I was three years old. Mm. These are... You think it's appropriate sex, to, for a teacher to tell a little six-year-old how to masturbate? You think that's appropriate? They're not teaching anyone how to masturbate. Comprehensive what are they sex doing? ed at its base is helping people understand. We educate each other on everything. School is all about educating educating people on different subjects. And the one thing that we're not giving kids any education on is their own body, their own sexuality, what's fundamentally important to us as a society. So then mm -hmm. it leaves the onus on parents to do that education, which they don't even have the tools for. And the average age that a child discovers pornography is eight years old. It's horrific, yeah. So and a lot of, the and, way to skirt mm -hmm. that is to educate. This is These are fear and lies around uh, like comprehensive sex ed, like a Again, what is a fear and a lie? That the teachers are showing you, like, this is how you touch your vulva. There are actual the curriculum that good. there's actual curriculum that shows images of young children and encourages them to masturbate. And I can, you know, we can do an addendum and I can send you the link and you put it in the. Yeah, the, I mean, I'd be curious so to see that. That's not the I can, education that I, I have. I'm glad to hear that. But I, also, I can, I can continue to speak to Planned Parenthood's comprehensive sex education, as you call it, if you'd like, to talk about the issues yeah, that I have with it. Let's go into it a little bit. Um, and, 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 and as the proactive, I'm a big fan of something called fertility awareness education, which is really essential to what it means to, be a, to, to have your sexual development happen. I mean, what's happening in your body? What, what does that mean to, for as a woman? How do you be healthier and happier? And then on top of that, relationship education, which it sounds like you're also in agreement with, but that can go a lot of different ways. Because Planned Parenthood says to young teens that you alone know when you're ready to have sex. That it's not, there's not some moral um, uh, universe around it that you get to decide 100% and your decisions are valid as long as you know, you're not being a victim of sexual violence, basically. Basically, consent is their only moral um, value that they place on it. And I think that's incredibly harmful to but that's teenagers. But up to you as a parent. But, and also, well, well, I but think it's, it's not up to me as a parent if Planned Parenthood is in my school promoting that kind of garbage to 
my well, young children. I, I don't think it's garbage. I think everyone, again, I'm a big believer in so personal you think- autonomy. And I believe that teenagers and even preteens are much more advanced than we give them credit for. I, I think agree with that. Minimizing a person's ability mm-hmm. to make wise decisions for themselves by giving them full access to all of the information that they need about their body and their sexuality promotes healthy decision making naturally and then when they go home and they can have additional conversations with their parents you could add addendum to that that would include your religion and your religious values that might not be taught at school it's not anti-religion it's not pro having sex young quite the opposite it's about giving kids all the information they need to make wise informed decisions about their body I, I, I think this conversation might not go as far as we would hope it would because you're using this term comprehensive sex education. Mm-hmm. I'm giving concrete examples of what is included in Planned Parenthood's version of comprehensive sex education. I don't have a problem education. with either of those, though. I have a problem but with you just, the way you're framing it. You're framing mm-hmm. it in a moralistic way, which is I'm telling so you that... So you don't think there are moral, uh, m- there's morality around sex? I think that everyone's morality around it can be completely different. You as a Catholic are going to have different morality than a Buddhist friend of mine. You don't think that there are any foundations for morality around sex? Absolutely. Comprehensive sex ed educates people on that. What does that mean? Let's let's talk. It's consent. So so consent is the morality that is sufficient for you when it comes to sex. As long as the person says that they agree to it, it's sufficient. No, it's incredibly complicated, which is why it usually in other countries and like Norway and Sweden, they begin at five years old and do an age appropriate conversation throughout their entire education because well, it's an evolving conversation but you just as said, their understanding yeah, I think, evolves. But you just said, Brenda, that everybody gets to decide for themselves, Absolutely. including children. And I'm trying I to... I didn't say including children. I think you that... We were talking about children. We're talking about sex education for children. I'm going to tell you, I I don't have any problem with either of the two points you just Mm -hmm. made. The way they're being framed is like more inciting than I think is necessary. How 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 is it? uh, How is it being framed? That's not. I accurate. guess let's call because, it a ch- well let's yeah, figure out what's to, a ch- what's a child like what do we because because I guess when we were talking about mm-hmm. you know like a, a child who was pregnant at 10 or 12 like that's considered a child like you'll use that word child but right now it sounds like you don't want to use the word child if it comes to comprehensive sex ed at 10 or 12 oh, or no, do you think no, that's yeah, a child no, you, so no. what age is you, it you, no longer yeah. a child not it, but what age? What like? Because because I, 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 I think that's where I think that's where we're getting hung up, or where you two are getting hung yeah, up. No, because, well, yeah, no, I wasn't. I'm not hung up on that language. I'm okay. very comfortable and confident saying there are children, there are preteens, there are teenagers. Yeah, okay. Like yeah, yes, I'm. I'm in agreement. So, so when you make a comment that they get to decide completely what's right for them, there's they shouldn't have some morality or some sort of um, compass for their behavior imposed on them. I, I just find that incredible to believe because certainly you think that there are certain uh, you know, rules of engagement, you could say, when it comes to sex. And then you mentioned there is one, there's consent. And then I asked you, is, well, is consent the only one? Is that the only kind no. of... No. Okay, then okay, what so else what's is another there? one? It's, well, for me, I mean, I have my own personal definition. But for comprehension well. sex education, because you're saying, I'm a comprehensive sex educator. You're saying Planned Parenthood does it, but you don't necessarily agree with Planned Parenthood's. And then you're saying that um, it involves this very nuanced, complex process. And I'm saying yes, children should be educated on their bodies and that they should be given relationship education age appropriate, but I think what we think that looks like or should look like is very different. So I'm trying to tease out the differences right now. I think what I hear implied mm-hmm. by people that are afraid of comprehensive sex ed is... I'm not, I don't know who's afraid here. I didn't say, well, a yeah. lot of people in a lot of but, media But, but it, what I've do you witnessed. mean by comprehensive sex education? Because I guarantee well, on, you... Let me, yeah. I, let me yeah. do this one first. Because... These are the options that I see that you uh, or women, mm-hmm. a lot of girls, will explore their body and start masturbating and orgasming at three years old. We start really young. I actually start at three, maybe even earlier. I don't remember. And that is very common. Boys will start later. But again, boys are discovering mm-hmm. porn at the age of eight years old. Are you what against that? Have, are you against that? Absolutely. Why? Why? If you're saying it's okay and kids should be kind of Educating supported in masturbating, the why are you have, have a problem with porn? No one, because, because, mm-hmm. I, well, I mean, are you against masturbation, I guess is a good question. I think that it is completely inappropriate for teachers 
or for parents, no, not t- not teachers, or like for if, parents. If I to in, to if to, I was a child at to three teach their cha- their three year old how to masturbate, I think that is child sexual abuse. No one so. needs to learn how to masturbate. You have it intuitively inside of yourself. What they are saying is that it is okay to explore your body, and your body so, is no. for yourself. You can't be touched in certain places. What you're doing is educating children. So you, I think you're sexualizing society. children. No, because a, a child who's no touching love. their their body parts to say that that child is masturbating and that the parent should somehow encourage or come around that child to allow that child to, or not even allow, but teach that child, well, this is masturbation. Why are you saying teach that child So what would you say, what's the appropriate okay, role of the educator? I have a question, though, for trying, you. Yeah. I have a question for you, Lila, because mm-hmm. could it be possible that it's hel- helpful to not shame or put down, like like she's saying, when children are not, like touching themselves and then, affir- she, I think I, she I might think be saying, hold on, I think she might be, yeah. I think she might be saying more like affirming that it's like, look, if that's something you want to do in the privacy of your home, something you might, I don't want to misquote you, but there's a lot of, um, in between Mm -hmm. where it's like, it's encouraging masturbating or not. Like this is kind of going off of the discussion, but it's kind of important too, because this is something you really consider helps prevent abortion in in what you call comprehensive sex ed versus what you call comprehensive sex ed is different. So I I think let's just finish this up. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and answer a little quick answer. And then I have another question to move on to. Um, I don't think that in any way children should be shamed about their bodies. Right. And I think that they should be given age appropriate guidance for their bodies. Like if, if their child says like, what's this? And you, sh- you make up some weird term for it. No, that's your vagina. That's your penis. I think that's actually really important to use. Great. Eye a- to eye. Okay. But what I think <laughs> is completely inappropriate yeah. and actually abusive is to take an innocent three-year-old who might be exploring their body or just saying, oh, what's, you know, what's this? And say, oh, that's masturbation. You can go in your room and feel around there and then you might figure, experience something called an orgasm. I think that's completely inappropriate and abusive and it's sexualizing okay. a three-year-old. Okay, thoughts on that. I don't know why you're saying it's sexualizing a three-year-old. Because then it is. I, then I was sexualizing myself. I think she, I think there might be what you're saying is like encouraging in a way of like, it's called graphic grooming. type of, yeah, versus. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. So, I, that's, yeah. okay, so that's See, a fundamental and difference this, here. And this to me is like really devastating that you won't come to the table with me on this particular issue because if you, if your organization would do me the great honor and pleasure of actually championing comprehensive sex ed that you and we I We still agree, haven't defined it, Brenda. Yeah, you, can't be- use, you can't use that. That's you're using, because you are saying things that I completely disagree with. But you just said you no agreed one, with Planned Parenthood doing it, that kind of education. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm confused on your position. Planned Parenthood is not talking about teaching. Like, you're not guiding kids in masturbation. You're not Some of these books anything. are. Some of their well, guess curriculum what? When they're eight years old and you've taught them abstinence only and haven't taught them anything about their body mm-hmm. and they discover porn, then they're going to know. I, I'm not you advocating for that. So I completely agree mm-hmm. on making sure mm-hmm. that children are safe and protected and not sexualized. The fact of the matter is a lot of children in this country are sexually abused and they will be discovering it way before that they even should have so you know what comprehensive sex ed can do is tell you you know when you discover this it's pleasurable right that is only for you that is for you is and if anyone else is then i think you can uh, you can avoid um teaching or uh encouraging in some way a child to explore masturbation and still teach them boundaries with yes. adults and protect a protective mechanism with, with with adults. So to conflate the two, I think, is incorrect. Well, no, I'm not conflating them. Like I'm to just say your private comprehend- parts are for yourself. You're not to. If someone is trying to touch you there, that's inappropriate. You say no. You walk. You, you you can do you can do appropriate protection training for little children who might be victims well, of sexual abuse. Well, the statistics are showing us it's not working. A lot of people I don't know are that it's not working abused. as much as it's not, it, some of it's not working and some of it's just not being done. But Planned Parenthood is not the solution because they are sexualizing children and a lot of their, their practices are horrible. And we've, we've done exposés telling, on them, we've done reports on them, and I can direct people to that. I mentioned two examples earlier. I mean, saying yeah. a child is being sexualized because they are being told to not have shame when they're exploring their body in private. I didn't and say them, that. I, I, I think that's yeah, I know. I you're saying things that are like really over the top that are not happening. Well, I don't mm-hmm. know if they're not I'm happening, not sure but I do think to. this is a really fascinating conversation on what comprehensive sex ed, it, what's optimal. Can I it, say one other just yeah, quick thing? Because yeah. I do have a curriculum that I think is fantastic, and that is done by a group called FEM. 
um, and they have some amazing, um, they're connected to some amazing curriculum that they're offering that is age appropriate, um, really focusing not just on your biology, there's some biology to it, but when you're very young, it's mostly about your relationships and your sense of self in the world. So there is, and if anyone's listening and is an educator and wants to know, is there a, a great alternative to say what Planned Parenthood is doing? Is yeah. it abstinence um, only? Uh, what do you mean by absence only? Like that it encourages to save sex for marriage as like the only option. I think that what I would encourage and what the curriculum later on encourages when it gets into that is when you have sex to understand that this should be in a relationship that is uh, uh, committed, that is, um, and usually these are the qualities of a so marriage, it has right? A religious bias. I, I don't know. I don't know how that's a religious bias. Marriage, well, not, marriage okay, is not a. So uh, I want to yeah. move on because we have other things okay. that I do want to talk about. But I do think because based on your sex can create new human life when you're uh, post puberty. So what okay. I what I There's wish we could come to terms yeah. with though is that if we had, however you want to mm -hmm. define it, if we had education in this nation to help children or help people not get pregnant and have inform information about their bodies throughout their entire lives, so they were completely comfortable and assured about the making of the body, the making of a baby, then you wouldn't have the big problem on your hands that you okay. do. Well, I think well, there's a fundamental kind of a, yeah. I think there's a fundamental disagreement on what the best comprehensive sex ed is and whether it should be up to the parents to teach their child versus public education. It's a fascinating topic in and of itself. Could be an entire episode, mm -hmm. but I do want to move on. I'm glad we got to talk a little bit about it though. Um, so let's talk about some challenging circumstances, which is a lot of the for, like uh, the conversation around abortion, right? Like back mm -hmm. to that, right? Even though this is so important, I know that the oh, yeah, comprehensive sex ed for sure. <laughs> I know that this is a big part of like the conversation that's formed around what help, helps prevent unwanted pregnancies and all that. But Lila, what is your position on? I know you kind of talked about it, but let's mm -hmm. like elaborate a little more. And then I have a tough question for a um, uh, a circumstance oh. for you, <laughs> for a certain uh, like a hard circumstance okay. for you as well. Mm -hmm. My first question to you, though, Lila, is what is your position on abortion when it comes to the horrific instances of rape or incest mm -hmm. or when there's an extreme health risk to the mother? Mm -hmm. So often, a lot of times when people talk about abortion, it is, or, and like pro, being pro-choice is yeah. like, well, how could you limit that for women who have extreme yeah. health risks? How do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. um, rape and incest are horrific, and um, a survivor of sexual violence deserves all the support and care, counseling, um, support of people around her. We need to be much more aggressive about prosecuting and holding abusers accountable because there's a lot of abuse running rampant in our society and p abusers are not held accountable. Uh, if a baby is conceived, there's an innocent third party now. There's another human life there. And so the solution to sexual violence can never be uh, homicide, can never be taking out the penalty for the crime um, onto the child. I mean, that's this myth of uh, generational sin that you're, you're in, in, in the myth of general, generational sin in the terms of consequence that because your father was a rapist, then you should bear his penalty or you should bear a penalty and be killed for it. You don't deserve to live. You're, you're less than human. So I think that in that situation, they deserve the care and support. They deserve, women deserve, survivors deserve care and support, but the solution can never be to kill that child. And what about the extreme health risk of the mother? Um, for extreme health risk of the mother, I mean, there's a common misconception in the abortion debate um, promoted by the pro-abortion side that abortions are medically necessary, that you need to intentionally end the life of that child in order to somehow provide medical care for the mother. And I work with thousands of medical professionals who say adamantly, no, we can care for them both, and we should. And if we want to in improve maternity, uh, maternal mortality rates, if we want to improve um, the condition of pregnant women in this country, we will not turn to knee-jerk having an abortion in the pregnancy, kill the baby anytime there's a health issue or crisis. We need to work on addressing what are the underlying conditions that that woman might have that is making her pregnancy more difficult. How do we accompany her and have the right checkups and routines in place to ensure that we're catching something in time? There's a lot you can do in the medical process that doctors do do, pro-life doctors, to care for both patients, and that's what I would advocate for. Okay, Brenda, response? I mean, I agree. Abortions in later pregnancy are not, I mean, they cause so much pain and strife and heartache. And I've heard those stories and I've talked to those women and it's, it's truly a horrific thing. So yes, I mean, I agree. Our healthcare system and the way we take care of women and the, the babies should be top priority. And I'm sure that it is in many instances. I, I think, again, there's not like, 
a nefarious group of people that are just like super excited about killing babies, there are some people that go to that more too quickly. There are other people who do absolutely everything they can mm -hmm. to do exactly what you said. I think it runs the gamut. Humanity runs the gamut. But ultimately, I, of course, agree with everything you just said. So do you, I, do you I, agree then? Oh, not with the rape stuff. <laughs> okay. Yep. So, that, okay. so then you can talk about that. Go yeah. ahead. Oh, just to respond, you've mentioned this a couple of times, this nefarious group of people yeah. that doesn't exist that, you know, are it maybe enjoy or, you know, are profiting from the violence of abortion. And I can tell you that they're... I don't know about the term exactly nefarious, but there are certainly um, very ideologically driven, violent uh, practitioners of abortion. Um, one of them who's in behind bars right now, Kermit Gosnell, because he wasn't, he's not behind bars for killing the child right before birth, but he's behind bars because some of these babies would be born. And this happens in, in late term abortion. A child can survive the abortion attempt because labor has been induced. And before the abortionist has had a chance to complete the abortion, the baby can be born. And uh, Kermit Gosnell is behind bars because he not only killed one of the women in, of his patients, but he killed multiple children after birth. So there are abortionists. I've been undercover with some of them. Our team has been undercover with some of them who are practicing in this country legally, um, who are laughing about how they dismember the child, who are uh, talking about how they use their toolkit to dismember that child, talking about how the child, it's like getting the child run over by a Mack truck uh, during the abortion. I mean, really gruesome graphic things. This is not some shock language from a pro-lifer. This is from the words of abortionists themselves. And I would encourage people to look at Live Action's Inhuman Investigation, which is exposing the actual abortionists themselves in their own words, talking about their abortion procedures that they're committing. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a lot of, pardon my French, fucked up people in the world. And I really think that's atrocious, obviously. But the issue is that that's not the majority of abortions in this country. And that's not... 10,000. 10,000. It's not nothing. Late term, I'm, I'm that, never I mean, saying that it's not nothing. I'm it's even never... more, more than children that die from guns. And guns, as you said, is a leading cause of death. But 10,000 children. leading cause of death. Just well, saying, but you consider these. Ch but, but hold on, you're being in a little bit. You're being contradictory here because you said that uh, after 21 weeks, you consider them human lives, persons that should have legal protection. And 10,000 abortions annually happen after 21 weeks in this country. So that you know. Again, children killed by guns, horrific. Those children are being dismembered, some of them live dismemberment, some of them lethal injection abortions. But I've, I've yet, I mean, I've instigated uh, conversations on my channel. Can't you be I've against got, both? Well, the thing is that I am against so you, later, mm -hmm. later, what is it? Abortions later in pregnancy for no reason at I all. I guess what I'm trying to say is those abortions you know, you mentioned how we need to care about the leading cause of death for children, right? And so I'm, I'm just sharing that that's 10,000 abortions, and that's according to Planned Parenthood's research arm themselves, Guttmacher and the CDC. That the latest statistics I've seen, I think from 2021, was about 7,000 children killed by guns, also horrific. So the leading cause of death, even by your definition, is abortion for children. No, because I wouldn't define it that way. And again, it's getting into the irrelevance for me because it's not that it's irrelevant. You can like deeply hold that mm -hmm. yourself. But what I am saying and I've been saying and I will continue to say is that until this place is welcoming to new life and makes the yes to have a baby an easy yes and doesn't have all these obstacles of going into debt for health care, of maybe dying when you're there because two out of three maternal deaths could have been stopped. That is egregious to me. It's egregious to me that people get in such dire circumstances of poverty or abuse or of sexual abuse that they do perform abortions on themselves if they're not accessible legally so so would you support banning abortions i'm, I'm confused about your position because at one point you said they're children and now they're not children again would you support banning abortions after 21 no, no. weeks i'm just laughing to yeah. i'm not laughing at you i'm yeah. laughing to myself because i'm i'm admittedly telling you that mm -hmm. i have not thought a lot about that terminology and that lingo and what i know forget what the I terminology hold. for a minute do you support you know you clearly support um doing whatever we can in public policy to stop gun deaths of children, right? Do you support 
using law to protect children at 21 and up weeks from lethal injections and dismemberment? Well, I think for me, it has to be necessary and a medical necessity. I what medic? What do you mean by that? I mean, there's a lot of cases. I mm-hmm. also I've like talked to a lot of people. I'm going to also say that I'm not completely mm-hmm. informed about all of the nuance about what happens beyond 21 weeks. But the people that I have talked to are in great, great pain about it. It's not something because that's it, done a, willy-nilly. Because they know it's a child and it's extru- and it might actually, excruciating for the conscience. And so it's so wrong of us to say, go for it. No, it's not the conscience. Mm-hmm. I mean, some the conscience men- of the person who's having the abortion, it's excruciating. For, for many for many women, I think but you're acknowledging that. that's because they wanted to keep the baby, but it was medically necessary. And, they, and if they happen. were told it was medically necessary, and that is what makes me um, so uh, But we've angry already about agreed on our, that. I already, already told agree. you I agree on that. So, if, you, if so you do agree that it's, that it's not medically necessary, that there isn't an instance on that? Because that is something that a lot of people, I think, are very, very confused let's on. Let's put it this I'm, way. Let's put it this way. In a late-term abortion, um, just to keep it very simple here, in a late-term abortion, the child... You know, you're talking about a viable baby that you're saying you support protecting their life. I think you is what you're saying. Go into descriptive of how they die because I already know. I mean, I'm, I'm going to share that you can deliver that child via C-section or a vaginal delivery. And abortion, the difference between that and abortion, deliver that child alive and give that child a fighting chance. And abortion is designed to first kill that child and then deliver. The child. Yes. So what I'm trying to say, and from the medical, I mean, back to the question of uh, medically necessary in, in the late term, and, and it's for the early term too, and we can talk about that more if you'd like, but um, you can let that child live because in any procedure used to deliver that child, if it's an abortion, you're killing the child first. Just let, let, them, let them live. Let them be born alive. So it's, there's, no, there's no medical necessity to kill the child first. Where we see eye to eye mm-hmm. is that if there is not a necessity to do it. I don't want it to be legal. I don't want anyone to just go in and be like, I want this late term Mm -hmm. abortion. It costs $20,000 anyway. So I don't know who. Well, the state of California, the state of California will pay for it. um, Well, that's because right now, whatever framework we're in, in if if there's a dispute on whether or not it's necessary, Mm -hmm. that again, is another really good conversation we could have that would actually propel some forward motion between our movements that I think would be beneficial. Because if we do decide together as a team that there are circumstances Mm -hmm. in which it is egregious and it is not necessary, then we could champion that together. And I could agree with you that that wouldn't be right, whatever that circumstance may be. But the current knowledge mm -hmm. that I have is that it is considered a medical necessity in all different kinds if of circumstances. If your source is Planned Parenthood, yes, you will get I that don't answer. only have one source of Planned okay. Parenthood. Okay, well, if your source is abortion advocates, yes, they will and probably tell you that. And women have experienced it. So what is medically necessary? It. What is medically necessary? Mean? I admittedly don't know enough about it yeah. to tell you. All I do know is that I have not once spoken to anyone who is like, willy-nilly did this because I decided to. It is an incredibly traumatic, difficult decision for people to make. And it is a decision that they feel and their doctor and their care provider felt was out of medical necessity. Did you know, I mean, I have a question. Two things. One, so do you think that doctors are lying to their patients that they need an abortion? Many are misleading them. Okay, and then two, can you guys get on the same page then based on the way you're explaining Mm -hmm. it, based on what it sounds like you might be saying, I'm not totally sure, that you both agree that later, at least late-term abortion is never medically necessary, that instead you can induce the baby and try to take care of that baby? Or do you agree that that medical... I'm not agreeing with that. I'm saying that I don't have enough information on it, but the current information I have on it is that it is medical necessary in certain cases. And if it's not Mm -hmm. I would get on the same page with you and say well then there needs to be more information and people need to understand that there is more choice than one but Mm -hmm. if there is more choice than one and if it isn't medically necessary then you know either way these people are going through an excruciating decision the the abortion is very excruciating for the child as well I mean a doctor should never Mm -hmm. be misleading anyone into anything so I agree with you on that Mm -hmm. but I don't I don't know enough about late-term abortion or abortion later in pregnancy to actually get into the mire of what that looks like. Okay, what about 
um, abortion being considered medically necessary in the beginning of a pregnancy because I've, you know, I've seen stories where women are saying, I, I got pregnant, I wanted to have this baby, but I had to have an abortion because of specific medical mm -hmm. issues, medical, not saying necessarily just, you mm -hmm. know, the child had a fetal mm -hmm. abnormality or anything like that, but maybe health risk of the mother. Can you explain your position on that? And let's see how you feel about that. If there's any common ground. As just an example, um, Dr. Anthony Lavatino, who is one of the, uh, professionals, medical professionals that we work with. He was one of the ones who was behind our first abortion procedure series, ex you know, explaining what happens during the abortion procedure. He worked at a high risk um, facility in upper New York uh, for many years, uh, treating uh, tens of thousands of patients. And he said in his entire time treating high risk pregnancy, so he was a specialty doctor to go to my clinic to do that. He never had to use abortion to resolve the medical emergency or or you know make the the pregnancy or the mother healthier in some way so, so what is the difference then because like let's say there was something are you saying because it's the way that you do it like if you uh, induce the baby even if they're before viability you know that child won't survive that that's not abortion is that what you're explaining well i mean you're, are you talking about the distinction between care for a pregnant mother in a risk high risk pregnancy situation yes. in the late ter later term no, versus I'm talking earlier in the, term? in the earlier terms like if we can acknowledge and agree like you're saying you're not so sure um but if you can if you come to the if you came to the conclusion that oh okay yeah late term uh pregnancy that if they were told that you know you, we have to abort your baby because of xyz medically necessary you're saying instead adduce the baby which induce the baby and give that child a fighting chance mm -hmm. which is what i've seen other doctors I say saying, as well i think that can, the first yeah. the beginning of pregnancy mm -hmm. If someone is like, like if, if there's a certain situation where there's something very extreme, health risk of the mother and the baby, are you saying that instead of, you know, dismembering the child in the way that you depict what mm -hmm. abortion is, instead if you induce the baby that that's not, a, not abortion? Because I think people are really confused yeah. at what the, what the difference is, what I, is I abortion, what's not. I think I see what not. you're saying. I think yes. I see what you're saying. And I think oftentimes the very high risk stake situations with pregnancy happen later on in the pregnancy. And so that's typically where the, this conversation is landing about these later term situations. In some very rare cases, there might be in like an emergency situation, there might be the need, extremely rare cases, and so rare that even this doctor never saw this case in his clinic, right? So we're talking less than 1%. Less than probably 0.0001%, extremely rare cases where um, labor might need to be induced before viability. And these are extreme cases. And even some doctors, pro-life doctors you'll talk to say like, well, if you just give them a couple more weeks, you manage the pregnancy, she's in the hospital, watched her vitals, we can make it for both lives. We can still make it for both lives. So you would get pushback from some doctors on this. But in that situation, if it's a game time decision and that, that's, you know, that's not possible for some reason, I think there could be some, um, you know, if the, if the goal is not to kill that child, you're not going in there dismembering that child, but you're inducing an early delivery and hoping that you can provide care for that child to live, that's not an abortion. Okay, do you so agree with that? that's your question. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, no, it's really interesting. Like, I need more education But that's not what's this. happening. I mean, what's happening is they're going in there and they're killing the child. I mean, so that's that's how abortions well, are done. I, so. The reason why I think this topic is so mm -hmm. important, Len and Brenda, you yeah. go ahead and reply, is that this is a really common reason why people are pro-choice. Because they say, for one, what about rare extreme circumstances, horrific mm -hmm. instances of rape and incest, for two, and then the other example is, you know, extreme circumstances of the health risk of the mother or non-viability. Well, actually, the, the most prevalent one is not even those two because it, like for example state of florida um they have they have research on how many um of the abortions are in the cases of rape or incest it's 0.2 percent oh no right? i meant the so, reasons why people say pro okay. why they are pro-choice well not saying mm -hmm. the reasons why abortions happen mm -hmm. i think we're all in agreement of that but just saying this is why i'm pro-choice yeah. because of what about these circumstances well a lot of the times it's i think there's even another dimension to it which is that um especially those on the pro-abortion side are saying we need, and then they use like it's a medically necessary abortion. That language is sometimes used. They're actually not even talking about a health condition the mom has. They're talking about a fetal abnormality, a disability that the baby might have. And they'll say this this abortion was medically necessary because my baby. They might not use the word baby, but because the fetus or something has some sort of um, disability. Okay, what are your and, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, again, but it's wrong to kill the, the baby. I mean, in that situation, I would say the same thing. It's wrong to kill the baby. This it would be like if you're the doctor that you were talking about before who saw no instances of abortion in later term. If he was he, high risk pregnancy in general. So it's it's largely the later term is when it becomes high ri most high risk. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. pregnancy is a risk and it is it's <laughs> it's a lot. But if he has had that experience and he has that information and that education and, and he knows how to 
provide a place that those babies can come out and be viable, I think everyone would be overjoyed to hear that, and we would want that information more accessible everywhere. I don't think there should ever be an abortion care provider misleading someone, not doing their due diligence to make sure that every everything is up to bar and they aren't pushing someone in a certain direction. Like it should be completely unbiased and based yeah. on reality but and fact. You said earlier that late term abortions can be up to twenty thousand dollars, and that's true. Um, what's the incentive for an abortionist who's doing late term abortions to say, "Don't come and have my abortion. You don't need it." I mean, the basic ethics of being a human being and doing right by people. I've talked to some of these people, these providers, and they truly believe they are doing an important service. And, and so you think the, they're the, encouraging? The parents in those situations believe the same thing because if there is information that shows that these are not medically necessary, then there would be a lot of families that would be overjoyed to hear this. Like. This to me is one of the biggest, like most common misconceptions that's in this argument that makes people on my side look so evil to the other side. Like, oh, we're just allowing this to happen or we're feeling willy nilly about this. When in fact, this is one of the most traumatic events in a person's life. And if there's another option, those parents are there seeking that option. They didn't come in there being like, I'm in the eighth month and I don't want to do this anymore. They're coming in because they feel there is a reason. And to your point about like anomalies or things that are, um, what word am I looking for? Disabilities or anything like that's also a shame. I truly believe that because there's so little education. And I think the U.S. is getting better at that. Even something as sweet as TikTok has been helping people get more accustomed to the idea that there mm. are people in our society that have disabilities and they're not able-bodied, but they're living full and beautiful lives. That to me is like the power of a story, the power of understanding that that life is valuable. Mm -hmm. That is something that actually is really important to me. And then again, mm -hmm. goes back into the idea of, OK, then are we putting them into a society and into a place where they can thrive in mm -hmm. that body? And that really is the question to me. But we agree here on these little points. OK. I, I, I would just have one more question. Sure. And then I have a question for you. <laughs> I mean, can you acknowledge then the, um, the impact that legal, not just legal abortion, but kind of culturally accepted abortion, like your autonomy, you make the decision, it's, you know, it's, it's your body, your choice, that whole mantra ideology, uh, the impact that that has on um, disabled babies getting killed, or the impact that has on a woman who's being told by a doctor, oh, you have to have this abortion, when maybe she didn't, maybe she could have had medical management of the pregnancy to help her and the baby be carried to term. What about it? Do you, do you see that the, the impact that when there's legal abortion, when it's being accepted as this is a good, you know, good for women or this is, you know, can be a, a great thing for women. Now, when you get pregnant, you do a genetic test, you find out your baby and this is a friend of mine or not even a genetic test. You do the 20 week scan. The baby is missing his or her arm and termination is offered right, right then and there. Right. Really? That's yes. That's that's. I that's, mean, that sounds that's, that's not insane. just That's not just what they offer. That's, that's seen as their job to I've, offer I've that. definitely had friends who have been um, told that their baby might have Down syndrome, so you should probably abort. But I that's was one of those that's, babies. <laughs> <laughs> but that's legal abortion for you. That's the culture of death for you, where uh, we see abortion but, killing as solution. And so if the baby's sick, if there's any issue with the pregnancy, if there's any sort of problem that the woman's facing in her personal life and that she feels, again, fear that's directing her towards the abortion clinic, then that is what she's affirmed, and that's the that's that's the way to go. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. I think, again, that there needs to be structural things implemented, resources easily accessible. If you have these resources, people should absolutely know who they are nationwide. Mm -hmm. And doctors should not have any bias lean towards wanting to perform abortion or to, especially if someone is coming in, or well, if you, maybe if exclusively, actually, if someone is coming in and saying, I don't necessarily want this. My partner is abusive. I'm living in poverty. I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. I would love to live in a world where that did not lead to an abortion because there was that support there, which is why I do appreciate this work that you're doing. But as far as choice, I still think that there are so many cases that don't fall under that category. I had an abortion that was autonomous. 
I am not in pain about it. It's not carrying through my life like a trauma. That's my own experience. I've internalized it in a very personal way that's meaningful, that's spiritual. And you and everyone, I think, has to grant the fact that people are going to have a myriad of different feelings about this, and there's just not one thing. And again, come to these agreements where we find them and see what we can do about them. You and I both agree that doctors should not be pushing this as the only option. But I also would add to that, we also need to make it so our society is a place where that option is accessible, where you're, we don't have to experience that fear because that fear is no longer valid. Oh, my, my kid does have childcare. Like, I'm a single mother who's working. I have five years to try to figure out how the hell to make money. I would love to get another job to supplement my income so I'm not struggling as much as I am right now, and I can't. So things like that have made my life so much harder and put an undue burden on me as a single mother. And we do that in so many different instances. So again, how can we make this world better to invite that, okay. to invite that yes? Okay, so I'd like to ask another specific like challenging circumstance on your opinion on um, the topic of sex selective abortion, where for example, the parent chooses to abort the baby girl because they're specifically wanting a boy. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think that's insane. Yeah. I would think, yeah, no offense, but you're crazy. Like, but <laughs> no, right. you, I ahead. think, or, sorry, I'm not ahead. trying yeah. to make a joke of everything. I just right. like, that's, that's but it does happen. Really? Yes. Where? Who? Well, a hundred million girls have been killed um, uh, globally because well, globally, of sex selective right? abortion, and, like, and there are rates of sex selective abortion in parts of the United States that are as high as in mainland China, because certain communities in the United States are doing practicing sex selective abortion. I mean, that's devastating. That's just misogyny and patriarchy at work. That's that's really devastating. But did you know that Planned Parenthood has advocated against bans on sex selective abortion? Well, I believe that would be because they agree that abortion should be performed no matter what the reason, that exactly. you cannot determine what a reason is. It just But it sounds like you is your choice. disagree with that. Well, I, I do disagree with that, mm -hmm. and I believe that there's obviously roots in... So why do you continue? To, why have you said multiple times you support Planned Parenthood? And I, I think it, I, that's hard for me to understand that you think it's completely insane to have a sex selective abortion or support a sex selective abortion because that's like a that's like a headline versus what is actually happening it's a like, reality for but some listen the yeah. headline would be planned parenthood allows for sex selective abortion that is a captivating headline it's, it's like oh shit this is crazy it's not no listen it, it, i know yeah. it's happening but the real story i believe behind it from my understanding of education is that it's not sex selective abortion that they're advocating for they are simply advocating that you can have an abortion up to a certain point for any reason that the the a provider providing that service is not to ask or make a moral determination on why you're there if you are there because you want it, they're there to give it to you with the addition of all of the system they have in place when they brought me room to room to check in to see what was happening, why I was there. Like I said, I was there for okay. nine hours. I have a short question for you to answer and then a short question for you. And then we need to get into something really important, which is the foster care and adoption system. OK, but short question for you, then, if you are adamantly against sex, something like sex selective abortion, meaning there are certain circumstances where you feel absolutely that should be like, do you agree that should be illegal then to get a sex selective abortion? Or do you think it's more just about education and hoping our society doesn't go in that direction? Or is that something that you think should be illegal? Short answer, though, because I have a question for you. Yeah, Lyla. no, I don't think it can be made illegal because then that all of a sudden puts like moral judgment on all the specifics when in fact it should just be the person's choice. And, okay. and then I find it tragic. I wish that wasn't the case. OK, so Lila, would making abortion illegal actually reduce abortions? Weren't there yes. a lot of abortions yes. <laughs> happening before abortion mm -hmm. was illegal where people call back alley abortions, which mm -hmm. are more dangerous to the women getting yeah. them? Some people actually say that if abortion was made illegal, abortions wouldn't actually go down. Women who die would just go up. That's incorrect. Um, when Roe v. Wade became, you know, when judicial, not, you know, seven men on the Supreme Court decided abortion for the whole country, abortion, the abortion rate skyrocketed. So absolutely there are, there are, there will be abortions that happen even when it's criminalized. Uh, that's where societal education has to come into place. Wouldn't that and be because they were illegal, so you wouldn't have known how many abortions were happening? There were a lot of estimates being done on how many abortions were happening illegally because there are doctors who were 
I mean, it makes sense it. if a service so, suddenly becomes available yeah. that people are going to use But there it. have been studies that have been done, and you know, Texas is the most obvious example right now and the most recent, that when you ban abortions, and this makes sense just for human nature, when you, um, you know, 30 years ago when we had seatbelts were not uh, required by law, most people didn't use them, and then with education and legal changes, behavioral changes happened. And that's the reality for illegal, abortion, too. But so you wouldn't actually know how many abortions are occurring, because now that we have the pill as well, people can be getting abortions in Texas without them knowing it, and frankly, they wouldn't be able, like, if it's illegal and you're going to get prosecuted this, or your mm -hmm. provider is going to get prosecuted, they're going to be hidden. Like, the, I don't think there's any way to statistically show that that's true. I mean, even the Guttmacher Institute Planned Parenthood's um, research arm has said that the abortion, uh, fewer women get abortions when they are more expensive. That's just an example. So when you create a higher barrier to get an abortion because they're not legal there's not an abortion clinic on your street corner selling abortions right or on your in the middle of your town selling abortions more women will not have abortion more children will be have their have their life which leads great into the next question mm -hmm. that's what i would bring up like so wtf do we do with this excess of children that have been born to people mm -hmm. that did not want to have them they were yeah. forced to have well them. that's well, the question yeah. that we're going to talk about the foster care system mm -hmm. so the foster care system plays a role in these questions for sure lila one of the arguments against ending abortion is that mm -hmm. the foster care system is already overwhelmed mm -hmm. and that forcing women who are pregnant into motherhood who don't want to be parents will create more broken homes and mm -hmm. over overwhelm the foster care system even more. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. I think um, life is worth fighting for, and that has to be our starting point when it comes to a conversation on foster care. So with that as the starting point, and that includes the life of a foster care kid, and that includes the life of a child who's in the worst situation of abuse. I wouldn't say, oh, it's better that you were not born. I would say, let's get you out of that abuse and let's work to work for healing and work for a better life for you. And I think this is where societies have to really kick into action. You know, there's, a, there's whole um, pro-life organizations where a big part, and we refer for this, um, we are not doing this, but this is an example, Love Life, and their whole focus is let's wrap our arms around this community where not only are we gonna shut down this abortion clinic, but we're going to be everyone in our this is a church thing everyone in our church is going to be fostering or adopting and we're going to be taking responsibility for every foster care child in our community and i think that's the model that's the way is we take responsibility in our communities for those that are suffering in our communities and um, i think we also need to have a uh, honest conversation about adoption um, I think adoption is not just saying, oh, adopt, no big deal. Adoption is a huge deal. That's my next and, question to her. So okay. let, why don't you answer that quickly, and then I have a question to you. But well, one, thing on, one, thing on a, one more just thing on adoption. There are right now um, some estimates up to 2 million couples, because infertility is a raging crisis, and just a lot of people want to adopt, who want to adopt that are not able to adopt right now. They ho would hope to invite a newborn into their home, and they're not able to. I know. That's so, ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, it's ridiculous. And and what are we doing? We're we're killing children instead we're, in abortion we're clinics. We're keeping the four hundred thousand kid in foster care away from those parents. I, it, the well, they're not all available for adoption. The purpose of the foster care system is family reunification, primarily, if at all possible. So, the solution to foster care isn't just we'll adopt all those children out. Um, sometimes because you know the ch the parents in rehab or there was like a death in the family and they're trying to find out what family member can care for those parents. So it's it's very complex. But a lot of them wind up their their entire adolescence and teenage years, and 50% of foster kids end up homeless by the time they're 18, 50%. And numerically, you're saying that you would like a world that we're inviting a surplus of 600,000 kids that were not initially wanted by the pregnant person, which would be 1.2 million within two years. Well, you're assuming they're, I'm, I'm not following the argument because you're I'm saying. I'm saying, what are you gonna do? What, what do we do with mm -hmm. the 600,000? Because you're talking about one church taking in all of these kids and doing what they can. How we many kids We pummel taxpayer that? dollars that from the government into organizations like Obria Clinics, like Love Life, like Embrace Grace, that are doing work to care for both moms who want to parent and moms who want to prepare for adoption. And we, we, we're there on the ground supporting them and okay, supporting so those children. Okay, so talking about the, num the numbers don't add up. Like, I, well, I really genuinely mm -hmm. want to understand if 50% of foster kids end up homeless currently today, 50%, and they don't what, have what, any can, infrastructure to support mm -hmm. them. A lot of them end up on the streets or you mean in after our they, prison just industrial to clarify, complex. When they've graduated out of the foster care system, there's yeah. no safety net for them. They're 18 years old. It's, yes, yeah. and 50% mm -hmm. of them wind up in And that's where, that's where we should be as communities joining and financially supporting 
the organizations that are intervening in those children's lives to help them have better lives. Okay, so my question for you, Brenda, then, is about how adoption also... And that's what many pro-life organizations are doing. Okay. The numbers... Okay, but but here's my question to you. Have hope. With enough of us working together. Life is worth fighting for. But you won't do education with me, sex education. So how? Okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. We're not going back. (laughs) Not what we had. I have some really important (laughs) questions. Decrease the numbers. Listen to me. Okay, so adoption also forms this conversation, Brenda. Infertility, like she said, is on the rise, and for every baby given up for adoption at birth, there are dozens of families wanting to adopt that baby. Why is adoption not a sufficient option for those with unplanned pregnancies or unwanted pregnancies? Why can't abortion be banned and create a more flourishing adoption system where babies can go to families? families desiring to adopt a child because a lot of people conflate and get confused with the foster care system and the outright adoption system because the foster system is like she said you know meant for reunification parents who wanted to keep their babies and um ended up losing their child due to like drug use or whatever different circumstance whereas outright adoption for women who find themselves pregnant when they aren't ready to be parents and don't want to be a parent yet or at all um, can give their baby up for adoption at birth and there will be dozens of families wanting to adopt that baby so how is that not or is that a sufficient option like could that be the solution or do you absolutely feel that even just the pregnancy should be a choice again the numbers are just too they're too high to provide a really good life or even just like a sufficiently okay life where someone is fed every day, has a, has a roof over their head for 600,000 extra people when we already have 400,000. I, I mean, right now our population is on the brink of not even replacing itself. So it's not like we have too many people in the United States. and Yeah, but it's too many yeah. pe- people that mm-hmm. would be unwanted by their caregivers. Someone wants them. There are, there are groups and organizations that are growing every day with volunteers and financial dollars and I wish our government would kick in and support these organizations too that want to help and are ready to take on the challenge. Well, yeah, I agree with you there. But I also, again, wish that we would do our due diligence and prevent pregnancy and educate from a young age because then those numbers would be more manageable. I simply, I I think that's a beautiful thought, but I think 600,000 surplus of people every year is an unmanageable thing when we are not even remotely managing the people that are already here living in poverty, et cetera. Okay. So since, sorry. I know. I feel like no, I keep lost going. Que- the no. question though. No, that's is, okay. Do you have an answer to that question or do you want me to move well, to the no, next I question? Well, no, I do. I do think it's insufficient. I think the foster and uh, adoption systems have to be amended and that everyone who wants a child should absolutely have immediate access to one or very quick access to one because we do have this issue. And that I think if that was amended, more people would feel comfortable giving birth because I can completely understand. I myself, like when I was pregnant, my dad was like, well, just give it up for adoption. And I was like, to what? My, my dad's own um, first wife was in the foster care system and she was viciously sexually and physically abused her whole life. So I'm just like, what am I giving my child over to? I'm not going to do that to me. It was an act of love. But you don't give your to- child. I mean, I think there's a misunderstanding there that's pretty profound that needs to be addressed, which is that if you're a pregnant woman and you're considering adoption, it's not that you give your child to the foster care system. You can actually place your child with a private couple of your choosing on your terms. And there are organizations that will connect you. They'll literally give you menus of couples that you can pick from. And I wish someone had talked with you and counseled you and given you that opportunity to understand that as your option. I mean, that's that's beautiful, and that's how it should be, and I love to hear but that, that and I would love if that was more prevalent. But instead, you went to Planned Parenthood, and they didn't give you those menus of, of uh, those options because they are an abortion clinic, and that's what, again, breaks my heart about our current system, that but, we have abortion clinics that women are walking into. They're not given their, all their options. They're not given access to the resources that exist for them both to carry to term and parent or or to choose an adoptive couple, you didn't, you weren't offered that, Brenda, and you deserved that. But this is why a conversation like this is so important, and this is why, again, uh, earlier I said get off the mouse wheel, because this, again, is where actual change can occur and where we agree. Like, I do mm-hmm. think it is egregious that people aren't given the list of options easily accessible to them. Yeah. On the other hand, I would also say, being realistic, people do know where to get those options. I I would have been able to navigate and figure out how to give my child up for adoption. That is a choice I didn't want to make because one thing that I haven't given proper weight to yet is pregnancy. Pregnancy can absolutely be beautiful. I I hated the 
I hated it. I know you have a different feeling. I love pregnant. I know. She's like, I love being pregnant. Yeah. Just running around, adorable. Um, I didn't have that feeling, but still, it was beautiful, and I love my child, obviously, et cetera. But my bladder and uterus fell out because I didn't have pelvic floor therapy, which is standard in places like France where women are given aftercare. When I had my baby, I lost my insurance a week after I had him and I couldn't get my postnatal checkup because all of a sudden I was in a different demographic and couldn't, I was no longer as valuable now that he wasn't in my body. So I have been witness to these flaws in our system that again, make pregnancy not this like lying on a lily pad, having a great time experience that it frankly should and could be if we actually took care of pregnant people, which the fact is we don't. All of the things that I have illuminated throughout this conversation show that. And then there's also the additional toll on the body forcing someone mm. to carry a child for 10 months, because we all know you're pregnant for 10, not, not, not nine months, is a huge toll on your spirit, your mind, your body, all of it, to enforce that upon people who truly don't want it, who are truly saying, this goes against my free will, this is something I do not want, also I, is something that I believe causes pain and hardship to the baby. We do so many lessons where it's like, you play classical music and you eat the right food and you make sure you're nourishing that body, mind, body, and soul as you can. And if someone doesn't want that, and you're forcing that, they're not going to get the same TLC in utero. And So, it's, so and we should afterwards. kill the baby instead? Well, right. I think everyone absolutely should have a right to that autonomy because, yes, it is, it is no small feat mm -hmm. to carry a child and to force I, someone I, to do I that. I would encourage you, Brenda. It sounds like the organizations that you work closely with or the people that you're close with don't seem to... Uh, have the care needed you know the community you're around the care that it's is necessary for United pregnant women States of America. well i i'm i work closely with you know the pro-life movement and i would invite you to join but some of our organizations are work because like a, i I'm but be part of the I solution join join one of our organizations instead of planned parenthood which is not offering I've prenatal care in the back planned parenthood they're okay. just the only organization i had access to i'm not well but there was <laughs> but i guess what i'm trying to say, what i'm saying is planned parenthood is a national brand that has received over time billions in taxpayer they're the dollars only one. they're not they're the only one they're filling in a gap that is absolutely they're necessary committing abortion no one else is but providing. brenda they're not providing um, in the vast majority of their clinics, prenatal care. They're not providing parenting support. They're not providing financial support they're for young mothers. They're, they're not providing, uh, pr you know, birthing classes. Birth they're not. Control. Can you they're respond? They're not that. They're not a birthing center. They're. It's but that's true. my. They that's are, my point. My but point is they're present. But they're for It's not just abortion. Mm -hmm. They but, prevent mm -hmm. pregnancy in enormous numbers. Fifty percent of Planned Parenthood's for. patients come into their facility having been using birth control in the month that they got pregnant. So the birth control that they're giving out fail. is failing and women are coming uh, to their facility to then buy their abortion because they're pregnant. And what I'm trying to say is there, let's do an alternate model for women's health. That is not the kill your baby model, but it's the model of let's provide holistic care so that you're not worrying about the $6,000 bill once you deliver. Well, that I love that. Go, but like, go, but what that's, what that I, that's, like? what, that's what I work with right now, Brenda. That's what the pro movement is doing. Ch learn, you know, Google Obria Medical Center or look at um, Heartbeat International. CareNet is affiliations of centers that are providing care and connecting women to free prenatal care and free resources. Or learn about Let Them Live, which is literally paying medical bills for women. There's a whole universe of care out there, but they're not getting the attention and they're not getting the federal tax dollars because who's getting it? Planned Parenthood, who in the name of women's health, they're claiming to be for women's health, is actually for abortion. Well, I think we need a system that is all that holistic care. But, but we're not going to have it as long abortion. as Planned Parenthood is the boss because they are not friends of you know, providing all of the options to women and making sure that they have all their bills paid. That's but not their focus. But you aren't going to provide all the options either. Not personally, because I'm one person, but I can work no, with I a mean, network I of mean, thousands who do. I mean, an organization that you want, if I'm not mistaken, wouldn't provide all women's health care 
No, they do. Obria. Okay. Oh. Okay. Because so abortion's I, not healthy. The but. difference, I think, is the whether the government should be doing this or whether we should be making small organizations, nonprofits, and doing it. I think as it can be. Individual. I think there can be a, a or it both. Can be a, okay. It can involve. Yes. Both. So I have like five more questions to quickly get to. Short <laughs> answers, guys. Okay. So can you address what she was talking about? Women who truly find it traumatic to go through pregnancy, don't want to go through pregnancy, and even this is a very specific question I was even going to ask about women who are really suffering mentally mm -hmm. and would struggle immensely to go through yeah. pregnancy, like someone with depression Wait. who's on medication that could affect the baby's development. Do you have sympathy for women who feel like they just mentally cannot handle it? What's your thoughts? They need better mental health care. We need better mental health care, and they need to be connected to mental health resources that, resources that do exist. Killing the child is not going to give you better mental health. It actually will deteriorate your mental health. And studies that have been done have proved that in the year after a woman has an abortion versus if she had chosen to have give birth and let that baby live, she's 150% more likely to commit suicide. So if you want to talk about m women's mental health, abortion is only going to deteriorate her health. Thoughts? And then I'm going to go to the next question to you. I mean, I absolutely agree. Mental health care is an egregious like, Abortion is not mental health care. <laughs> it deteriorates mental health as well as kills a child. I, yeah, I don't think abortion should be a solve for any mental health issue. Uh, but again, because that infrastructure doesn't exist and we are not providing that on a nationwide scale, I think it is too pie in the sky to put into action before it actually exists. Because if we're forcing birth as early as June or July, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, which it probably will be, we don't have any infrastructure in place for anything that I described in this conversation to support that influx of children, to support the people so, who are suffering through mental okay, health. Okay, so do women need to rely on abortion to succeed in society? And if they do, is that a good thing? Oh, <laughs> good thing. Um, Again, because I am a single working mother, I am struggling financially because there is no childcare for my son until he's five, or there's no school until he's five that's provided. So absolutely, it holds me back in my career, and it, I could get much more accomplished. He would also benefit so much from the socialization and the ability to be around other kids, that's something that I cannot financially provide for him right now because, again, there's no structure in place to help me with that. So that's just my experience, and I know I am a very, very privileged person, and that's a privileged experience still because there are many women who are literally working multiple jobs for a minimum wage that doesn't amount to anything to support their existing children. and they are not able to pull them. You can't pull your bootstraps out of that situation. There's not enough okay. there to support. Quick mm -hmm. answer on the thoughts on the question I just asked her mm -hmm. about, like, do women need to re um, rely on abortion? And then I have another question for yeah. you. I think that we need to double down on the existing support systems, shore them up, improve them. A lot of that's what the day in, day at work, besides educational work and lobbying work, which is what Live Action does and other groups, there are your thousands. lobbying work is, like, just just for the prevention of abortion, not to lobby, to have all of these things that you believe in in place? Like, well, we're for child tax credits for families. And I'm so asking curiously. As, like an, as an example, as far as other public policy options, paid family leave, child great. tax credits for So you're for lobbying children. for these things? Yes, we've publicly. Hell yeah. yeah. That's what There's I'm talking great. about. Something we found common ground on. Oh <laughs> my gosh, I'm but so I, happy. But I think they're, you know, What's heartbreaking to me? Because I don't see that a lot in that party. What's heart? Well, I don't, I, I mean, you're talking about parties. It's uh, there's a lot of progressives and Democrats who are pro-life, so I, I think it's you can find them in both parties. But yeah. um, I think it, what is heartbreaking to me is that we have women who are not being connected right now to the resources that do exist in communities. And one of the primary reasons for that is because of Planned Parenthood, because they are staking ground as the place to go and saying, we are there for you. And they're getting the taxpayer dollars for it. And they're getting the marketing dollars for it. And they're getting the you know celebrity support for it. And they're even getting corporate support for it. And they're actually not providing options for women. They're getting all of that privilege and support to what? Then go saying, We're, here's, a, here's an abortion for you. Instead of, okay. here's the prenatal care. Here's, so that's what yeah. I would advocate is for. Shut that whole lethal business down and replace all that societal cachet, all that financial support, and put them into the organizations that are actually solving problems for women and providing care for their for their children. Is that something you could get on board with, possibly? Well, somewhat. I just, I think money should be re reallocated in so many ways. Mm -hmm. We spend... But Planned Parenthood doesn't want pro-life centers to get... In fact, 
there are pro-abortion activists right now that are literally throwing Molotov cocktails into pregnancy resource centers. And Planned Parenthood well, is not speaking out against that. that's been happening in the reverse forever, too. I mean, there, there's egregious behavior on both sides. But I'm not seeing it decried by Planned Parenthood right now. I mean, they're kind of the, the lead. And I'm not surprised because they're for abortion. I can totally so. understand your rub with Planned Parenthood. My issue is that, again, an organization like that sprouted out of a need that wasn't being met, and the need it was sprouted from a myriad of other needs that lead to that. Okay. So I, yeah. Okay, next question, sorry. <laughs> what about overpopulation, Lila, is having more people around bad for the planet? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, overpopulation, can ne if it exists, could never be solved by killing part of the population. So, you know, abortion's never the answer. You don't kill off your youngest members, most vulnerable members, to solve population issues. But we're actually facing a population crisis, underpopulation right now, in much of the Western world. So in most of Europe, they're not replacing their own populations. Their populations are shrinking, and the uh, population demographic is increasingly elderly and less young, and so that imbalance is creating huge economic and social problems. Uh, there aren't enough people to care for an aging population, as an example. And that's happening in the United States as well. And part of it is because of the fearful rhetoric around birth, motherhood, and children, where we are saying, it's so hard, it's so bad, it's so negative, you should have the abortion. Or we're saying, you can't have a career without having an abortion. Or all of that negativity around life is a huge driver of the population crisis. And you know the solution to that, again, I can go back to what I was saying before, it's education. It's connecting people to the resources that they need. It's a mindset shift about we're here to support each other, and a child is not a threat. It's not an enemy. It's, it's part of the family now. We're going to fight for each other, have a fighting spirit about it. That needs to be the, uh, the focus for, for the underpopulation crisis, not, not just to solve underpopulation. I mean, life is worth fighting for, its, for in and of itself, but it certainly would help prevent some of the looming economic um, issues because of that crisis. Thoughts? Or... Well, bringing up economics is, is so complicated and, and nuanced as well because we created a population that's like working class, that's living in capitalism, and it's not working for everyone, and it hasn't worked for everyone for a long time, and we're seeing that disparity more and more all the time. So uh, the term like population crisis is really conflicting to me because I don't think there's any crisis in people choosing to not have a child, let's just say by means of condoms and birth control, like just actively being like, I'm in a family plan, I'm gonna do this when I want to. But there's a lot of women who are, as an example, um, delaying pregnancy um, for many years for many different reasons that later on regret it. I mean, there is a, you have to admit there's a societal push. It's not like just everyone makes their own decision and there's no pressures on them. I think there is definitely a societal push today to um, say that you should delay having kids or having children is going to hold you back. I mean, there's a lot of negativity no, around I can it. Absolutely. And there are a lot of challenges around it, too. Those yeah, challenges are I real. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There, mm -hmm. There is fear-mongering around it. I don't even like when people are like saying, like, it's hard. I hate mm -hmm. it. Like, I don't like all of that rhetoric either. That's just my mm -hmm. personal opinion because I love being a mom and I see so much beauty in it. So, again, it's not so black and white of, like, this movement is saying that it's bad. I think the distinction is that my side of the aisle is saying that it is so hard. There is so much undue burden because of everything that I've talked about. Like, if we had not had to deal with undue burden or if I had access to get my son into school tomorrow or yesterday, it would be a different story for me in my career and what I was able to do and capable of. And under capitalism and the way the economy works now, which really doesn't work for the majority of us, that creates something that feels like an economic crisis because it doesn't work for everybody and it's not instigating people to want to bring new life into this place. Okay, so I think we covered so much. I, I'm going to have to skip the last few questions because I know we're on like a timeline. We've been going for such a long time and it pains me to not ask these last few questions, but maybe we'll do a part two or something. Um, but the last question, just to round it out, um, I'll start with you, Lila, and then I'll let you finish. The news is packed to the brim about updates on Roe v. Wade, which is the decision that declared there was a right to choose abortion as a federal law in the Constitution. As of the time of this recording, the Supreme Court looks like they might overturn it. Do you 
think the court will overturn Roe, and what will that mean for our national conversation about abortion? Mm -hmm. You answer, and then you answer, and then we're done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for hosting. Yeah. Thank you, Brenda, yeah. for Thank the conversation. Uh, Roe v. Wade, I think, will fall. I think that at least the court will do damage to it. It was unjust. It was illogical. Um, it's created huge devastation. Over 63 million children have been killed since uh, Roe v. Wade became the law of the land in 1973. It's just the beginning, though, because what would happen if this court chooses to overrule Roe is they will likely, as they say, have a, the states decide abortion. And that's not the ultimate solution. I mean, it's not up for state legislatures to decide who lives and dies within their state. Those children deserve all of them legal protection, whether they're um, in a blue state or a red state or no matter, the, no matter the state that they're in. So I think that we have to get, 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 our, get to work. Our movement is just getting started, both to provide legal protection in the states that we can if Roe v. Wade is overturned, um, to continue to advocate for the national right to life that all of us possess. I think it's a constitutional right under the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment says that we have, um, we, we deserve equal protection under the law and that no state has the right to deprive someone of their life without due process. And that's certainly what's happening to children in a state that permits abortion. So we should continue to argue for that constitutional right to life that all states should abide by, and then we gotta work day in and day out. Abolish abortion where we can, provide the support and the care for women, expand these organizations I've been talking about, get them uh, to continue to grow and continue to educate. Educate people about the abortion procedure and about human development, about the options that exist. Okay, Brenda, you. I also think it'll fall, and I am devastated, and I like cried my eyes out when I really realized the gravity of that and what it would mean for me and for so many. I just love people, and I care deeply about this issue and about who it's going to affect negatively, which is going to be a lot of people. And to me, I truly believe that is inhumane, unjust, and immoral to force birth. And in doing so, we are taking away the autonomy and humanity. We are dehumanizing people in a vulnerable state. And removing that choice from them is going to cause an exacerbated amount of problems for mental health, spiritual health, physical health, all of it. I truly wish to see a world. I actually am fine. <laughs> I know I don't want to say fine. I don't want to misspeak. But Roe v. Wade has flaws that I would like to see amended. I would like to see a new something in place where Lila and I and the things that we agree on are addressed in a way that is humanizing and full of love and really promotes a culture of life, which is what I want. And to me, Removing this, like letting Roe v. Wade fall and forcing people to give birth, it just, it really hits, it hits uh, me hard. And I am just really sad to see it because the more humane way, the path that I think is real and true and like honoring of what I believe spiritually would be to foster an environment where we look at everything on the table that causes abortion and we amend all of those issues one by one. I think letting Roe v. Wade is an easy way would out. Would you ban letting abortion fall, then? Easy way out. I, I, you're saying if you did all that, would, would you then ban abortion? If you somehow... I don't think abortion should ever be banned. I think it's inhumane to force someone to give birth. I mm. think that we can create mm. a society together if we all align mm. and get on the same page about what's truly important and fix those issues mm. one at a time, which would take so damn long and mm. so much work. You're doing a lot of that work now. But that would be the humane thing to do. And then if someone is choosing an abortion, it would be truly a rare case if we could amend the reasons that people are getting abortions in the first place, the misinformation they're receiving in the clinic, all of the things that you brought up. Mm -hmm. If both of our concerns were amended and changed, but people still had the preservation of their autonomy and right, that would be the world that I want to live in, and that's what I'm going to strive for. Wow, this was amazing. This was so good. Thank you <laughs> Thank guys you, so much. Thank I think you, we're going to wrap it up. I truly appreciate you mm -hmm. both coming on here and like being so brave to come out. And it's, it is, it's quite brave and vulnerable. Not many people are willing to do it. So I really appreciate the conversation. And we're going to end it here. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you. tuning in. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs>